Chapter 18 The Fillmores, Part 2 We want people to listen with their eyes closed, to just let the music come inside them so they can forget their worldly cares. D.A. As the Allman Brothers' popularity grew, Bill Graham continued to showcase the band at both Fillmores. Only days after Duane finished work on the Layla sessions, PBS affiliate WNET shot footage at the Fillmore East for a planned documentary. The lineup included the Allman Brothers, the Birds, Albert King, Van Morrison, Elvin Bishop, and others. Duane and the band performed Don't Keep Me Wondering, Dreams, In Memory of Elizabeth Reed, and Whipping Post. It was one of the few times a performance by the Allman Brothers with Duane would be captured on film. In the Fillmore footage, the front line from left to right is, as always, Greg, Duane, Dickey, and Barry. Behind them, Jamo sits between Duane and Dickey, with Butch positioned between Betts and Oakley. It's an unusual configuration, and one that emphasizes the band as a brotherhood. No other rock group prior to this had placed its primary lead vocalist off to the side of the stage, hidden behind a massive Hammond B3. And despite the fact that Duane is obviously the leader, snapping his fingers to set the tempo and count off each song, using his guitar neck like a conductor's baton to bring each song to an end, he too chooses not to stand center stage. The film is a fascinating glimpse into the band nearing its apex. There is so much interaction among the players, the various cameras never seem to know what to focus on. When one camera finally settles on showing the two drummers playing simultaneously, but playing completely different parts, it's difficult to take in. It looks as if they should sound cacophonous, but it all meshes perfectly. Another camera zeroes in on the two guitarists standing next to each other and playing lead licks together, but the cameraman is soon stumped. He focuses on Dickie for a while until he figures out that it is the other guitar player who has suddenly taken off into the stratosphere. Dwayne Allman on stage is a charismatic figure. He doesn't jump around like Mick Jagger or flail his arms like Pete Townshend, all of the movement is in his hands, and not a motion is wasted. As the Coracedon bottle slides up and down the neck of his Les Paul, his pick-free right-hand fingers fly across the strings. But this is 1970, a time of flamboyant rock stars. So the camera pans up from his fingers and zooms in on his face. If the camera is hoping to find the requisite looks of pain and anguish, it won't find them here. There is expression in Duane's face, but it is a combination of concentration and serenity. As he plays a passage near the top of the neck, his brow furrows for a moment. Other times his mouth opens slightly, as if he's coaxing each note into its proper place. A cat comes to my band to pick, not to show off his fancy clothes, he will tell a reporter a few months later. We want to share our music with the audience, but there's no stage show. This ain't no ballet. It might not be a ballet, but there is a gracefulness to what is going on among the musicians on stage that no other rock band of the day could match. After Duane had finished his two-concert interlude with Derek and the Dominoes, he met up with the rest of the Allman Brothers Band in Columbia, South Carolina, on December 4th. The band opened for Johnny Winter and, the albino virtuoso's oddly named group, with fellow guitarist Rick Derringer at the Carolina Coliseum, and then moved on to the Music Factory in Greenville, North Carolina. Dates at the Fillmore East were coming up on December 11th and 12th, so Duane headed to New York for a radio interview to promote the shows. On December 9th, Allman arrived at WABC-FM to chat with disc jockey Dave Herman. 
The general idea for the evening was to preview the Fillmore shows, talk a bit about the Allman Brothers and Derek and the Dominoes, spin a few records, and take phone calls from listeners. But the interviewer's best laid plans instantly flew out the window when Dwayne showed up late and out of it. I'm drunk, man, he told the DJ, when Allman attributed his condition to a bottle of Jack Daniels. Herman calmly asked, Black Label or Green? Black Label, of course, Duane responded indignantly. I'm from Tennessee, man. My grandfather washed his feet in Jack Daniels. For the next hour, Dave Herman had his hands full. Allman, who usually spoke slowly and articulately, was in overdrive. One has to suspect that much more than Jack Daniels was at play. Duane did manage to subtly plug the upcoming dates by bragging about bets. If you've never heard him play, come down to the Fillmore this weekend, man, and hear him. I'm the famous one, man. He's the good player. But there were other, more personal things on his mind. In the most brutally honest statement he would ever make during any interview, Allman talked openly, perhaps much too openly, about his recently failed relationship with Donna and about his daughter, Galadriel. I got rid of my old lady and my kid. I said, no old ladies, no kids, man, just guitars. She's a teenage queen, Duane continued. Herman, confused and perhaps sensing he was losing control of an interview that was turning into a monologue, asked, who's a teenage queen? Your kid or your... My old lady, Duane responded before Herman could even finish his question. My kid is a kid. She's mine. She's part of me. You can see me in her. I look at her and say, hey, me, how you doing? Children are good, man. If you love them, if you've got time to do it. It's not good if the old lady ain't nowhere, man. And my old lady... She's just, do you love me, son? No, I don't love you. I just seen you. You come by the gig and ask me if I'd ball you, and I said, okay, yeah. And then ten months later, I'm pregnant. What'll I do? What'll I do, I said. I don't know what to do. She comes down and she gets a crib, see? And she gets an apartment and she says, Dwayne, here's your home. Here's your home. And I said, Well, I've been looking for home. This must be it. So I run on in the door, man, and right away I start getting pulled at and shoved at. I don't want none of that, man. I don't want none of that. So I says, Okay, here's your bucks. Here's your car. Here's your trip. Hit the road. So it's just me and my old guitar. Listening to the interview decades later, it is still a spine-chilling speech. Had Allman been a superstar at the time, his cruel confessional most likely would have been career-wrecking front-page news in the tabloids. But in December 1970, as far as the mainstream media was concerned, Dwayne Allman was just another guitar player in a rock and roll band. Despite everything, the conversation wasn't short on levity. Duane was talking a mile a minute, explaining in an almost incoherent fashion about the formation of the Allman Brothers Band when Herman jumped in. You do a two-and-a-half-hour interview in ten minutes, he told Allman. When the disc jockey added that he thought people from the South are supposed to talk slow and mellow, Duane responded, Oh, I am. But you get up here, you have to talk fast, or somebody will talk in front of you. When phone calls started pouring into the station, one listener spoke of seeing the Allman Brothers open for Blood, Sweat, and Tears at the Fillmore East the previous year, and then asked Duane what he thought of the group. After a lengthy silence, Allman finally responded, My mother told me when I was a child, If you can't, don't. Moments later, the interview was finally, mercifully over. 
Through a haze of alcohol and whatever else was in his system, Dwayne Almond had once again found a way to, in the words of Paul Hornsby, show his ass. This time, however, it wasn't in the privacy of an hourglass recording session. It was on a radio show with thousands of listeners. Perhaps Dwayne just got drunk and high that night for the hell of it. It certainly wouldn't have been the first time. Maybe all the Christmas decorations in Manhattan were a reminder that the anniversary of his father's murder was approaching. On the other hand, the upcoming Fillmore dates could have played some small part in his desire to get shit-faced before going on the air. On the 11th and 12th, the Allman Brothers would be second on the bill behind Canned Heat. Remarkably, Dwayne's old nemesis, Dallas Smith, had finally figured out how to make a blues rock record. His production of Boogie with Canned Heat, with its hit single On the Road Again, had turned Smith into a bona fide rock producer of no small renown. The irony wouldn't have been lost on Duane that the musically superior Allman Brothers band had to open for a Dallas Smith-produced act. After the Fillmore East shows, the band rounded out December with concerts in Washington, Boston, Macon, Los Angeles, and New Orleans. In January 1971, they played a gig in Statesboro, Georgia. Bill Ector recalls Duane opening the show with the line, I think this song seems apropos, just before the launching into Statesboro Blues. That same month, there were concerts in Boone, North Carolina, Atlanta, Pittsburgh, and Port Chester, New York. Then the band traveled across the country for a series of nights at the Fillmore West beginning on January 28th. The headlining act was the Jefferson Airplane offshoot Hot Tuna. To call the show eclectic would be an understatement. This time, the Allman Brothers found themselves wedged between one of San Francisco's favorite acts and something called the 24-piece Trinidad Tripoli Steel Band. But the ABB's perseverance in playing at Bill Graham's showcase venues, even on sometimes bizarre bills, was about to pay off. In March, the band returned to the Fillmore East to make what Rolling Stone would one day hail as rock's greatest live recording. With two studio albums under their belt, the Allman Brothers were about to fulfill one more of Dwayne's dreams. In 1970, he had told disc jockey Ed Shane, you know, we get kind of frustrated doing the studio records, and I think consequently our next album will be a live recording to get some of that natural fire on it. The live recording that Duane had hoped for would eventually consist of performances from Friday, March 12th and Saturday, March 13th. The band actually played three straight nights at the Fillmore, beginning on Thursday. Ads for the show read, Bill Graham presents in New York, Johnny Winter and Elvin Bishop Group, Extra Added Attraction, Allman Brothers. Extra added attraction, indeed. No matter that Johnny Winter was billed as the headliner. By the final night, the Allman Brothers were closing the show. Tom Dowd was back to produce the album, but this time he was flying by the seat of his pants. He hadn't even planned to be in New York when the live album was being cut. I was supposed to be in Europe, he told Bill Ector. Dowd had been in Africa, working on the film Soul to Soul. From there, he planned to vacation in Rome, but when his plane touched down, he discovered it was snowing. I looked and I thought, I don't need Rome in the snow. So Dowd caught the next plane to Paris, eventually arriving in New York at the crack of dawn on March 10th. After checking into a hotel near the Atlantic Records office, he slept all day. The following afternoon, he called Jerry Wexler to let him know he was in town. That's great, said Wexler, because the Allman Brothers are recording tonight at the Fillmore. 
With such short notice, Dowd had no time to speak to Duane or any of the other band members. He took a taxi down to the Fillmore East and hopped into the truck that housed Location Recorder's mobile studio. The band didn't even know I was back, said Dowd. I'm sitting in the truck and prompting the engineers. So the band comes on stage, and all of a sudden I hear horns, and I like to nearly wet my pants. I went out of that truck, I mean, I came tear-assing down, and when they came off, I grabbed them and said, Get the fucking horns out of my life. They're out of tune. They don't know the songs. Whose stroke of genius was this? When the man finally calmed him down, they asked Dowd if they could keep one horn player and Tom Doucette on harmonica. He agreed, but the initial show was a lost cause. The first show, half the tracks that I could have used were wasted because I had horns on guitar parts and they were terrible. It was pretty grim, said Dowd. So that night, in order to make a point, we went up to my studio with the tapes under my arms, and I played the whole concert back to them. They were sitting there and said, Yeah, you're right. When they did the next night, I didn't have to worry about the horns. Although the eventual album would include tracks from both the 12th and 13th, Dowd felt the contributions by saxophonist Rudy Juicy Carter, who had been featured on some of the second night's performances, weren't quite gelling with the band. By Saturday's gig, Carter was sitting out. In fact, for a while on Saturday, thanks to someone phoning in a bomb threat, it looked as if everybody might be sitting out. But after the Fillmore had been searched, the show resumed. Much of what was recorded during the post-bomb scare set on the night of the 13th became the material on at Fillmore East. Technically, the Allman Brothers Late Show actually took place on the morning of March 14th. By all accounts, the band didn't hit the stage until sometime after 2 a.m. Recollections of the duration of that final set vary greatly, depending on who's telling the story but it's safe to say that it went on for well over three hours. The final encore, which didn't make it onto the original album, was Drunken Hearted Boy, featuring Elvin Bishop on guitar and vocals, Steve Miller on piano, and Bobby Caldwell on percussion. At the end of the song, Dwayne said, That's all for tonight. But nobody wanted to go home. As the crowd continued to cheer for more, Duane, in semi-disbelief, told them, Hey, listen, it's six o'clock, y'all. When the cheers continued, he tried a different tactic. Look here, we recorded all this. This is going to be our third album, and thank you for your support. You're all on it. We ain't going to send you no check, but thanks for your help. And with that, the Allman Brothers' three-night stand at the Fillmore East was finally over. Each night after the show, Stoud said, the band and I would boogie on up to Atlantic Studios, listen to the tapes, and make some instant decisions. When we listened to them, we knew what we had nailed and what we might have to work on. And we started editing. We don't need to do this song tomorrow. Let's change the set. On the second night, we mixed two or three songs down. The third night, we go back up to the studio after the show, listen to it, and say, yeah, that's it. They were gone, and the album was done. What wasn't mixed was talked about being mixed, like if you can scissor this one to that one, or make this one fit that one, go ahead. Dowd mixed the album quickly. He did, in fact, scissor this one to that one in a few cases. But by 1992... When Dowd was asked to remix the tapes for a CD reissue called The Fillmore Concerts, he had forgotten in some cases exactly which edits were performed where for the original LP release. Nobody ever got mad at me for the one or two I switched, and they knew I was doing it, he would later say. Songs from the March 12th and 13th Fillmore shows that didn't make the cut for At Fillmore East 
would later surface on Eat a Peach, the two Dwayne Allman anthologies, and the Allman Brothers' Dreams box set. Recordings from both nights eventually appeared together in one form or another on the aforementioned 1992 two-CD set and on the 2003 release of a two-CD deluxe edition of the Fillmore shows. But the reissues, even with their constantly improving oral qualities, longer durations, and nifty packaging, don't seem to have the same weight and power as the original seven-song double album. Tom Dowd had 20 reels of tape from which to create the live album. According to Phil Walden, Jerry Wexler wanted Capricorn to edit the material down to a single LP, and he was adamant about that. Wexler confirms the assertion. It's true, he says. As an executive, a person in the company concerned about finances, I didn't want a two-record set, and I didn't want it to go for six ninety-five. But Walden was equally adamant about making it a double album and about selling it for the price of a single disc. After negotiating a reduced rate with all of the publishers, he convinced Wexler to give in. In a subtle way, Walden explained, we were trying to suggest that the Allman Brothers Band was the people's band, and we wanted the album to carry a price tag they could afford. With Tom Dowd producing, the final selections, and even the sequencing of the album helped to make the two-record set one of the most critically acclaimed and best-selling live recordings of all time. The disembodied voice of low-key announcer Michael Ahern opens at Fillmore East with a simple introduction. Okay, the Allman Brothers Band. It is the only low-key moment over the course of the ensuing one hour, 18 minutes, and 19 seconds. As soon as they are announced, the band kicks into Statesboro Blues, the song written and first recorded by Blind Willie McTell in 1928. At the outset, the Allman Brothers version appears to be a close copy of Taj Mahal's 1968 rendition, which inspired Duane to learn how to play slide guitar. But there's an electricity to the ABB's take on the song that makes all previous interpretations pale in comparison. For the first time, the full, raw power of the band has been captured on record. The fact that there are two drummers has never been more apparent. One comes out of each stereo speaker, playing different parts that flawlessly interlock. Dwayne's 40-second slide intro leads into the vocal, and then his guitar returns to respond to every line Greg sings. After the second verse, Dwayne takes his first solo on At Fillmore East. From this moment on, there's no turning back. If there was ever a question of who was in charge of this band over the course of the first two studio albums, the answer is right here. Greg comes back in with the third verse, and then Betts takes his turn in the spotlight. On the fourth verse, Duane is back on slide, once again complimenting Greg's every phrase. The song ends, and the applause clearly indicates that this was recorded before an appreciative audience. Up second is Done Somebody Wrong, a number Duane introduces as an old Elmore James song, We'd Like to Play You. This is an old, true story. Whether it's really true or not, the implication is enough to make one pay close attention to the lyrics. Best known for his recordings of Dust My Broom with its soaring slide guitar introduction, Elmore James had a unique talent for essentially rewriting the same song multiple times. But the Allman Brothers were savvy enough not to settle for covering James's biggest hit nor did Duane settle for copying the slide work made famous by the old blues master. As with Statesboro Blues, Duane kicks off the song with a slide intro. Greg sings the first two verses, and then Tom Doucette, the sole survivor among the originally planned collection of additional musicians, takes a solo on blues harp. 
His contributions to this and other songs prove that the combination of Dwayne's instincts and the compromise the band struck with Dowd on the first night resulted in a setting that made perfect musical sense. Decades after the fact, it is no more possible to imagine at Fillmore East without Doucette than it is to imagine what the album would have sounded like with the addition of a three-piece horn section. Doucette's solo is followed by 24 bars of pure bets before the song hits the third verse. Dwayne's slide intertwines with Greg's vocals throughout the lyrics, and then, unexpectedly, the band breaks out of the shuffle and builds up to a dual lead guitar, triplet bass crescendo, culminating in Dwayne's slide coming out over the top for his first solo of the number. Greg repeats the first verse. Dwayne takes one last short slide solo, and the song is over. After the two up-tempo tunes, the band slows things down. While we're doing that blues thing, we're going to play this old Bobby Bland song for you, Dwayne tells the audience. Then he adds, actually, it's a T-Bone Walker song. He's right on both counts. Texas blues man T-Bone Walker had first recorded Stormy Monday on the black and white label in 1948. Bobby Blue Bland's cover of Walker's composition came out in 1962. Both versions were major hits on black radio, with Bland's interpretation managing to make a little bit of noise on the pop charts as well. Bland remains one of the unsung heroes of blues-based rock. His 1961 hit, Turn On Your Love Light, was covered by virtually every bar band in the country and was a highlight of most Grateful Dead shows throughout Pigpen McKernan's tenure. And, as Paul Hornsby pointed out, both The Five Minutes and The Almond Joys had Stormy Monday in their repertoires. But just as Bland's Turn On Your Love Light might be thought of today as a Grateful Dead song in some circles, the Allman Brothers' performance of Stormy Monday on, at Fillmore East simply took the song away from Bobby Blue Bland and made it theirs and theirs alone. Dwayne, sans slide, starts the song alone on guitar for four measures before Dickie and the rest of the band join in for an intro that extends the length of a full verse prior to Greg's vocal entrance. For a few fleeting seconds, Doucette's harp can be heard during the intro as well. While Greg sings the first three verses of the song, Dwayne and Dicky trade blues licks. At the end of the third verse, Dwayne takes off on a solo filled with glissandos and bent strings. When Dwayne is done, Greg takes his first organ solo of the album as the rhythm shifts effortlessly into an up-tempo 6-8 time jazz feel. It's as if Jimmy Smith had suddenly jumped on stage. But as soon as the organist's brief moment in the spotlight is over, everything downshifts back to a slow blues for Dickie's solo, followed by Greg singing of the last verse. The song draws to a close on a sustained note, while Duane's guitar and Doucette's harmonica continue to whittle and wail until they both finally meet up with the rest of the band on the last chord. Tom Doucette's contributions to Stormy Monday are so tastefully subtle as to seem almost non-existent. It would take the release of the Fillmore concerts in 1992 for one of Dowd's amazing scissor jobs on at Fillmore East to become apparent. As the 1992 set reveals, Doucette had actually taken a minute-and-a-half harmonica solo between Dickie's guitar solo and the final verse of the song. But even the keenest ear would have a difficult time detecting Dowd's edit on the original album. You Don't Love Me encompasses the entire second side of At Fillmore East. Written by journeyman blues singer and harmonica player Willie Cobbs, the song has been covered by a host of artists by the time the Allman Brothers began performing it. Three years prior to At Fillmore East, You Don't Love Me had appeared on the Al Cooper, Michael Bloomfield, Stephen Stills LP, Super Session. 
Interestingly, that same album included a long jam based on Donovan's Season of the Witch, a precursor to the Allman Brothers' monolithic take on Donovan's There is a Mountain. As the track opens, Duane encourages the audience to put your hands together for this. He plays for eight bars before Dickie joins in and the riff begins to take shape. Eventually, everyone is on board, including Doucette. Greg sings the first two verses, and then Duane takes his first solo of the piece. Up to this point, the album has been all blues. But on this solo, Duane rocks. The singer comes back with verse three, and then it's Dickie's turn. Greg's organ takes up where Dickie's guitar left off, followed by Doucette's solo and the fourth verse. By this time, the song has been going full steam for six and a half minutes. Duane begins what at first appears to be another long rocking solo, but after less than 30 seconds, the whole band drops out, leaving Duane alone. Suddenly, all jazz has broken loose. It's the first sign that from here on out, the audience won't be listening to just another blues rock band from the South. Dwayne Solo slowly winds and stretches its way through what could be an entirely different number. This isn't about rhythm or melody. It's all about feel. Finally, Dwayne slides down to a low A and simply lets it vibrate, allowing Dickie to take over and simultaneously bring the song back up to its original tempo. Both drummers join in, and for the next three minutes, the ABB becomes a trio. Oakley jumps in a couple of times to establish a bit of foundation, but he's soon gone again, and it becomes Dickie's turn to go into free time. When Betts hits his last long sustained note, the whole band, including Doucette, jumps back in. Soon the two lead guitarists are playing together in harmony, and it sounds for all the world as if the band is about to bring the song to its logical conclusion. But once again, Duane is suddenly alone in the spotlight. He drops the tempo as he plays a series of slow, bluesy licks, and then it happens. Exactly 16 minutes and 16 seconds into You Don't Love Me, in the middle of a natural pause between two notes during Duane's freeform solo, a voice from the audience cries out, Play all night! It is one of the defining moments in rock. A single, jubilant fan, caught up in the excitement of the greatest live rock concert ever captured on tape, expressing the feelings of an entire audience, an audience that would grow from fewer than 2,000 in attendance that night to millions of listeners around the world in the decades to follow. Dwayne continues to play. He picks up the tempo for a moment, and the audience claps along. And then he's back out in space, and the audience pauses in mid-clap, waiting to hear what's going to happen next. The drummers and Oakley work their way into the mix. Greg's organ fades in, holding long chords, seemingly waiting to see where it's all going. Now the whole band is back, while Duane plays over the top, eventually letting his guitar ring out with the melody of Joy to the World, the cue that he's finally ready to wrap it up. As the song concludes with an old-fashioned three-note ascending blues ending, the audience goes wild. Seconds later, Barry Oakley's rumbling bass begins the introduction to Whipping Post, but it rapidly fades and side two comes to an end. Surprisingly, side three doesn't pick up where the previous one left off. Whipping post is coming, but not until side four. In fact, the whipping post on at Fillmore East is from another set. Instead, side three opens with Hot Lanta, a short instrumental credited to the entire band. The piece begins with Greg's organ intro, followed by both guitars playing the melody in unison, then repeating the pattern in harmony with each other. Greg takes a solo on the B3, 
followed by Duane and then Dickie. Not quite three and a half minutes into the song, Butch and Jamo tear into a 16-bar drum solo, or more accurately, drum duet. When the drums are done, the theme is repeated one more time before the piece goes into free time. Everything seems to simply float momentarily as one note vibrates through Greg's spinning Leslie speaker. Jamo's snare drum wraps out a few quick rolls while the suspension continues. Then, as if anything else unexpected could possibly happen after all that's come earlier, the sound of a timpani can be heard, very quietly at first, and then building to a huge crescendo. And just like that, the instrumental is over. Dwayne introduces the next track as a song Dickie Betts wrote from our second album, In Memory of Elizabeth Reed. The first section of the song features Dickie playing volume swells, making his guitar work sound almost violin-like. The instrumental goes through a couple of tempo changes before Dickie takes off on a solo. Greg's organ is up next, and then it's time for Dwayne. Once again, he leaps well beyond the bounds of rock. The performance is taking place at a point in time when many jazz artists have begun playing what will soon be labeled fusion, the playing of rock in a jazz context. With his solo on Elizabeth Reed, Allman does the opposite. He's playing jazz in a rock context. You know, Dwayne would later tell writer Robert Palmer, that kind of playing comes from Miles and Coltrane, and particularly the Miles Davis album, Kind of Blue. I've listened to that album so many times that for the past couple of years, I haven't hardly listened to anything else. What Dwayne found so captivating was the modal improvisation pioneered by Miles in the late 1950s. Extended soloing based on a single scale, or a sequence of scales rather than a chord progression. This concept gave great freedom to soloists to take the music in new directions, a freedom that the Allman Brothers Band embraced. When Duane's solo in Elizabeth Reed ends, the drummers extend the improvisational concept, taking center stage with a solo straight from the repertoire of kind of blues drummer Jimmy Cobb. The whole band comes back in, plays the theme one more time, and then ends the song so abruptly that there's a moment of silence before the audience erupts. At Fillmore East ends with Whipping Post. No longer the five-minute song it had been on the band's debut album. By 1971, Whipping Post had become one of the main set pieces the band would use to extend the boundaries of popular music. Taking up all of side four... This performance of Greg's composition clocks in at 23 minutes. When print publisher Hal Leonard put out a three-volume set of Allman Brothers Band songbooks in 1995, it would take 42 pages to transcribe the guitar solos in this version of Whipping Post. We got a little number from our first album we're going to do for you, Dwayne tells the crowd. Barry starts her off. But before the bass player can begin, someone in the audience shouts, Whipping Post! Just as Dwayne responds, you guessed it. Oakley begins to play what is now one of the most familiar bass patterns in the history of rock. One by one, Dwayne, Dickie, and Greg add their instruments to the mix before Greg sings the first verse. At this point, Dwayne takes his most electrifying solo of the album thus far, while Dickie's rhythm guitar pushes the song forward. Then, after Greg finishes the second verse, Dickie plays lead while Dwayne takes the rhythm guitar part. Ten minutes into the song, the band once again slips into free time, leaping into the unknown. It feels as though everything could simply fall apart at any second but Dickie continually pulls things back together at what, as usual, seems to be the last possible moment. At one point, the music almost grinds to a halt as Bet slows the tempo to a dirge. 
Oakley plays a series of melodic bass lines behind Dicky. The drums and organ follow along, waiting for the inevitable instant when the tempo will once again return to its original speed. When that moment arrives, the whole band kicks into gear, building to an ascending crescendo that comes to a dead stop before Greg begins to sing the chorus. The chorus ends, and had this been any other band in the universe, so would the song. Instead, everything is left hanging in midair momentarily as Dickie plays a few more notes, eventually leading into the melody of Frere Jacques. Dwayne and Barry join Dickie in reprising the melody as everything seems to be wrapping up once more. But the band still isn't done, and Dwayne begins playing a line that sounds straight out of the soundtrack of a Middle Eastern movie. Finally, Greg is back to sing the chorus one last time. Butch's kettle drums return, and whipping post comes to an end. As the applause breaks out, Butch has already begun playing the timpani intro to the next song. The other instruments join in, but the sound quickly fades. With an almost eerie foreshadowing of what lies ahead, the final side of At Fillmore East concludes with the opening notes of Mountain Jam, a track the Allman Brothers record-buying audience won't hear in its entirety until four months after Dwayne's death. Recording the Fillmore East album was probably the easiest way to record that there is, Greg once said. It's probably the cheapest way to record, and it's definitely the most fun way to record because it was live, and you had the excitement of the crowd, and you had two trucks outside with all the gear in it, you know. We just took the best from each night and put it together. That was our pinnacle, Dickie told Kirsten West. The Fillmore days are definitely the most cherished memories that I have. If you asked everybody in the band, they would probably say that. For the album cover, photographs were taken of the band in front of the Fillmore East, their name on the marquee above them. When nobody was happy with the way the pictures came out, photographer Jim Marshall was flown down to Macon to take new shots. With the Fillmore East more than 900 miles away, Marshall had to make do with what he had. And what he had was a brick wall in an alley near Capricorn Studios. The photographer stenciled the Allman Brothers Band at Fillmore East on one of the road cases, and then had the roadies stack all of the cases in front of the wall before bringing out the band to gather in front of them. Despite Jim Shepley's comment about a teenage Dwayne Allman dreaming of being a rock and roll star someday, once that day finally arrived, the guitarist chose to downplay the star image as much as possible. Nobody in the band is going to get dressed up real fine to satisfy someone's vicarious need to be a rock star, he once said. And so the entire band scowled as they sprawled in front of the road cases. Just when things were beginning to look hopeless for the photographer, Dwayne spotted a local dealer hovering nearby. As Jim Marshall looked through the lens, Dwayne disappeared. When Allman returned and sat down, baggy in hand, the whole band cracked up. Marshall snapped away, and the now classic cover of At Fillmore East was captured on film. Always loyal to the road crew that had been so loyal to the band, Dwayne insisted that the back cover be a group shot of the roadies. He wanted to do that because they were the unsung heroes, Greg told Alan Paul. He really had a lot of respect for the people that make the shows possible and set up the equipment just perfect every night. The back cover photo included Joseph Red Dog Campbell, Kim Payne, Mike Callahan, Joe Dan Petty, and Willie Perkins. Joe Dan and Willie were the two latest additions to the road crew. Petty had been the bass player in The Jokers, one of Dickey's pre-Second Coming bands, and Perkins, a college-educated former bank auditor, had been brought in to replace Twiggs Linden. The photographer's decision to have Red Dog, Kim, and Joe Dan holding cans of Pabst Blue Ribbon while he took their picture 
probably did more for PBR sales than any ad campaign the beer maker could have devised. Marshall didn't even try to get the roadies to stop scowling while he was shooting them. It was more than obvious that they were still pissed about having to stack all the cases in the first place. Since Twiggs was unavailable for the photo shoot, he was still awaiting trial in Buffalo, Red Dog went to Dwayne with an idea. You know, he said, we can put a picture of Twiggs up on that brick wall. Just because he's in jail, it doesn't mean that he's still not here with us. Allman liked the sentiment and decided to have Lyndon's photo superimposed on the wall above the rest of the crew, right next to the album's track listing. At Fillmore East was recorded in March and released in July. The reason for that long a period of time between recording and releasing the album was actually pretty simple, recalled Dowd. Looking at it from the record company's side, the Allman Brothers never concentrated on single records. So the album came out when they started their tour in July. It was a concerted effort. Touring and concerts and all were so different in those days. But you didn't want somebody going out there, and after they come off the road, you put their album out. You're a goddamn fool put it out when they were going out and get some attention. And Fillmore East got some serious attention, quickly. The ABB's two previous albums had taken a month or more after their release to hit the charts. This time, the record started going up the album charts within a matter of days. Throughout the summer of 1971, it continued to climb, eventually reaching number 13 on Billboard's Top Pop Albums chart. By October, at Fillmore East had gone gold. Ironically, before the album even entered the charts, Bill Graham had closed the doors of the Fillmore East for good. The concert scene had changed dramatically since the first Fillmore had opened in the mid-1960s, and Graham didn't like what he was seeing. In the early days, he had dealt with the bands themselves. But as rock music went from an underground community to an industry controlled by managers, agents, and record company executives, the cost of producing rock concerts on both coasts became, if not prohibitive, then certainly a lot less enjoyable for Bill Graham. In May 1971, he wrote a letter to the Village Voice explaining his decision. In the early days, Graham wrote, he and his staff had chosen every act that would be performing at the venues. Eventually, he found himself being forced to package shows according to the dictates of agents and managers. In the letter, he complained of everything from the lower quality of some of the current rock acts to the lower level of the audience's musical appreciation. But in the end, he concluded his explanation by saying he was simply tired. The final show at the Fillmore East, he announced, would be on June 27, 1971. The acts for that final series of concerts at the Fillmore were Albert King, the Jay Giles Band, and the Allman Brothers Band. The first two nights were open to the general public. The final night was for friends and family only. For Dwayne Allman, the weekend held special significance beyond the closing of New York's hallowed rock venue. Kurt Linhoff, a vintage guitar dealer from Texas, was flying in with the Les Paul of his dreams. I met Dwayne in March 1971 in San Antonio, Linhoff recalls. ZZ Top opened for them. Billy Gibbons introduced me to Dwayne, and he introduced me as this great guitar finder. When Allman told Linhoff what he was looking for, the guitar dealer responded, Sure, I can find that tobacco-less Paul, even though he had never actually seen one. I thought, why not? I can find anything else. By late June, Linhoff had located the guitar Duane had described, along with a load of tweed Fender basement amps for each of them, and a 60 Fender jazz bass for Barry. On the day of the first show of the Fillmore's closing weekend, Linhoff arrived in New York with the gear. I shipped all the amps up and flew with the guitars, brought it all to the gig. 
Jay Giles was hanging around with Dwayne because he wanted to see this guitar. As soon as he saw it, he offered to sell me his guitar. He had a cherry sunburst, Les Paul. He said he couldn't play it anymore after seeing Dwayne's. While hanging with Allman at the Fillmore, Linhoff had the opportunity to take in the whole early 1970s rock and roll experience. Backstage, there were about 20 dealers, about 20 chicks giving blowjobs, and about 30 musicians in all those little dressing rooms. It was a zoo. Behind every door, there was some serious nonsense going on. The Fillmore East was the best gig there was, says Butch Trucks. I think probably the best night we ever had was at the Fillmore, the next to the last night, closing weekend. We went on stage around two in the morning, went to about eight in the morning, six hours straight, finished playing, and there was no applause. The place was jam-packed. Not one person clapped. I looked out, and everybody's got a smile ear to ear. Some guy gets up, opens the door, and the sun comes in. And a New York crowd. They get up and quietly walk out. I remember Dwayne walking in front of me, dragging his guitar, saying, God damn, it's like leaving church. The following night, for the very last show at the Fillmore East, Bill Graham decided to add several more acts to the lineup. Along with Albert King and the Jay Giles Band, the bill would include Country Joe and the Fish, Mountain, Edgar Winter, and the Beach Boys. Having the Beach Boys on the bill must have been nostalgic for Dwayne Allman. Not only were the Allman brothers helping to wrap up the final night at Rock's Mecca, Dwayne and Greg would be sharing the stage with the band the Escorts had opened for back in 1965 in Daytona Beach. There was only one hitch. Just before showtime, the Beach Boys told Graham that they had to be the closing act. Few would dispute that the Beach Boys held an exalted position in Rock's pantheon. But in the mind of Bill Graham, the Allman Brothers were the single most appropriate act to wrap up the Fillmore East's last stand. In fact, the bad vibrations the Beach Boys were spreading on this historic evening were symptomatic of the reasons that had driven Graham to close the Fillmore's east and west in the first place. Graham's response to this demand was quick and to the point. As far as he was concerned, the Beach Boys could either perform when he told them to perform, or they could pack up their gear and go home. Upon considering their options, they decided to stay and play. And so, on June 27, 1971, the Allman Brothers Band closed the Fillmore East, following the very act that Dwayne and Greg had opened for in Florida only six years earlier. The mantle had been passed. As the Allman Brothers prepared to take the stage, this time the introduction was substantially more than a mumbled, OK, the Allman Brothers Band. It was Bill Graham himself at the microphone, waxing nostalgic. Over the years that we've been doing this, he said, the introductions are usually very short. And this one's going to be short, but longer than usual. The last two days, we have had the privilege of working with this particular group, and over the past year or so, we've had them on both coasts a number of times. In all that time... I have never heard the kind of music that this group plays. And last night, we had the good fortune of having them get on stage about 2.30, 3 o'clock, and they walked out of here at 7 o'clock in the morning. And it's not just that they played quantity. For my amateur ears in all my life, I've never heard the kind of music that this group plays, the finest contemporary music. We're going to round it off with the best of them all, the Allman Brothers. Whether the June 26 show actually ended at 7 a.m., as Graham said, or an hour later, as Butch recalls, is really immaterial. The bottom line is the band had garnered enough respect from the greatest rock promoter of all time to be given the most prized spot in the history of rock's most famous menu. The special thing, I think, 
that will always stand out is the Fillmore experience, Dickie said years later. When we were all young and we were all pretty naive and gullible and just really didn't know what the hell we were really into and not caring, and at the same time, we knew a hell of a lot more than a lot of people thought we did. And you know, then the old band was together. The old band, of course, being the one led by Dwayne Allman. It was only a matter of months before the days of the old band would be over. Chapter 19. Man and Allman Complexity is the only difference between blues and jazz. It's all the portrayal of the feelings and the soul in a medium other than words. D.A. John Coltrane and Miles Davis had ranked near the top of Dwayne's favorite musicians ever since Jamo introduced jazz to the guitarist through his record collection, including such albums as Coltrane's Africa Brass, Davis's Seven Steps to Heaven, and Tony Williams' Emergency. The influences of Coltrane and Davis were apparent in many of Dwayne's and Dickie's solos, especially when they stretched out as evidenced by the tracks recorded at the Fillmore East in March and June 1971. The Tony Williams LP had a lasting effect on the band, too, with its no-holes-barred improvisations featuring John McLaughlin on guitar and Larry Young on organ, as well as the leader's potent drumming. Those who saw the Allman Brothers live or bought their records were, first and foremost, rock bands. The average ABV listener was generally open-minded enough to groove to Duane's improvisational flights in the middle of You Don't Love Me or In Memory of Elizabeth Reed, but it's difficult to gauge what the reaction might have been if the band had suddenly whipped into a 20-minute version of Davis's So What or Coltrane's Giant Steps, which is not to say that the idea might not have occurred to Duane Allman. By the summer of 1971, Duane had been searching for a jazz outlet for some time. He'd been excited to meet Joel Dorn, Rassan Roland Kirk's producer, and had asked Dorn about working with the iconoclastic multi-instrumentalist. I actually went to Rassan, says Dorn. He was as much a one-of-a-kind artist as ever existed. He was also a man of gigantic conviction and passions so I thought Duane would be perfect. I went to him and said, There's this guy. You know about the Almonds? He said, Oh, I know about the Almond Brothers. I said, I'd like to do some sessions with you and Duane. I think you could really get something going. He took it as, Oh, now you want to put me with those rock and roll guys so I can make a hit. You're not interested in my music. I said, Nah, it's different. This guy is special, man. He gets the joke. You really ought to, but he wouldn't do it. So I went back and told Duane. I said, I really tried, but you know Rasan. He said, yeah, I know, but it was worth trying. Later, after he met Herbie Mann during Delaney and Bonnie's Central Park concert at the Schaefer Music Festival in August 1970, Duane was ready to take up Mann's offer to play on one of the flutist's future albums. It was just a matter of finding time between Duane's other studio work and the Allman Brothers' constant gigs. Mann, a Brooklyn native, had been making records since the 1950s. Like Miles, and to a lesser extent, Coltrane and Williams, Herbie had managed to capture a large enough audience to see several of his albums make it onto the pop charts. He'd even had a genuine hit in 1969 with an album called Memphis Underground. Before that, he'd cut an album called Muscle Shoals Nitty Gritty, but Eddie Hinton had gotten the guitar slot for that one. Dwayne liked listening to a lot of shit that I'm sure a lot of his contemporaries didn't listen to, says Dorn. I didn't know the rest of the guys in the band, so I don't have a sense of who was into what. On the other hand, I remember Herbie Mann used to talk about, in memory of Elizabeth Reed, all the time. 
and Herbie never met a good rhythm section he didn't like. If there was a good rhythm section, Herbie was on a plane. He was very smart. After the closing of the Fillmore East, Duane stayed in New York for his long-awaited sessions with Mann. Cut at Atlantic Recording Studios in only two days, June 30th and July 1st, the music that became the album Push Push featured an all-star cast, including Richard T. on keyboards, Chuck Rainey, Donald Duck Dunn, and Dwayne's old friend Jerry Jamott on bass, Bernard Purdy and Al Jackson Jr. on drums, and Ralph McDonald on percussion. Along with Dwayne, the guitarists were Cornell Dupree and David Spinoza. Produced by Arif Martin, Push Push turned out to be almost as much Dwayne's album as it was Herbie's. Allman took the guitar solos on six of the seven tunes, including, ironically, Spirit in the Dark, the title song of an Aretha Franklin album that had featured Dwayne on a couple of numbers, but not that one. Push Push wasn't a straight jazz album. Mann and Marden chose to cover tunes made famous by Aretha, Marvin Gaye, Ray Charles, the Jackson Five, and even the soft rock group Bread. So no one was going to mistake this LP for the work of Rassan Roland Kirk. But it would turn out to be Allman's only real chance to dip a toe into Rassan's world. At least the album would be filed in the jazz section at record stores. Being in New York also gave Allman the chance to get together with Joel Dorn and King Curtis. When I would be done working, and Dwayne was done and Curtis was done, and we'd have some time, you know, like late in the evening, we'd just hang out, Dorn says. Mostly get high and laugh. That's really what it was about. Dwayne and Curtis and I talked about doing some stuff. Curtis was another guy. I mean, everybody knows him for those solos on that R&B shit he did. But Curtis could play. We'd have these reefer conversations and say, Yeah, how about if we get this front line together in this rhythm section and do it? And I would say, Well, I can't play nothing, but I'll produce it. And Curtis would say, you can't produce. Why don't you just sit there and have some lunch or something? And we would start with that kind of stuff. As soon as the push-push sessions were over, Duane and the rest of the Allman Brothers Band headed for Newport, Rhode Island to play at the esteemed Newport Jazz Festival. This would surely be the chance Duane was looking for, an opportunity to play before an appreciative crowd that would allow the band to show off its jazz side in a serious way. Unfortunately, Newport wasn't ready for the crowd that an act like the Allman Brothers would draw. The night before the band was scheduled to perform, thousands of kids waiting outside the festival grounds decided to wait no longer. When they broke down the fence, the Newport police didn't react nearly as kindly as the Atlanta festival promoter had done. The end result was hundreds of hippies in the hospital and the cancellation of the remainder of the Newport Jazz Festival. Duane had to be more than a little disappointed, but there was no time to fret over what might have been. Within a couple of days, the band was in Atlantic City playing at the Steel Pier for a week. Then they were back on the road performing in Tampa, Atlanta, and Huntington, New York, followed by two shows in Manhattan Central Park. The day after the New York concerts, Dwayne, Greg, and King Curtis jammed with Delaney and Bonnie and Friends at A&R Recording Studios, and the show was broadcast live on WPLJ-FM. Then the band was off to Virginia Beach, St. Paul, and North Baltimore, Ohio. At the beginning of August 1971, the Allman Brothers took their first long break from the road since October 1969. Two weeks off was a true anomaly for the band. Although Macon had become their adopted home, their real residence was a series of hotel and motel rooms from one end of the country to the other. By this time, Duane had moved from the big house to 1160 Burton Avenue, where he lived with his new girlfriend, Dixie Lee Meadows. 
Before his acrimonious split with Donna, Duane had already taken up with Dixie, one of a group of young ladies known to the band and roadies as the Hot Atlanta Girls. Dixie would be the inspiration for one of Duane's handful of original compositions. They were living together, Dickie told interviewer Kirsten West. Duane called her Little Martha, his pet name for her. Years later, a rumor started that Allman had named the tune Little Martha after one Martha Ellis, a young girl buried at Rose Hill Cemetery. But Betts knew otherwise. Little Martha, for God's sake, is not a baby that died, he told West. Just as Duane's two-week break was coming to an end, King Curtis was murdered in New York City. On Friday the 13th, Curtis had gone to do some work on a brownstone he owned on West 86th Street. Upon exiting from the side of the building, he heard a man and woman arguing on the front steps. Angered by this disturbance taking place on his property, Curtis confronted the couple. When he did, the young man turned away from the woman, walked down the steps toward Curtis, pulled out a knife, and stabbed the saxophonist in the heart. Curtis had a horrible temper, says Joel Dorn. Songwriter Doc Pomus was always telling him when Curtis would get mad, watch yourself, man. That temper's gonna kill you. And he was right. He ended up dying because he couldn't let shit go. If somebody did something he didn't like, boy, he didn't care who it was. The day of the funeral, Atlantic Records closed its offices. Held at St. Peter's Lutheran Church in Manhattan, the service was a testament to the music community's admiration for King Curtis. Duane was there, of course, as were Brooke Benton, Delaney Bramlett, Ornette Coleman, Aretha Franklin, Dizzy Gillespie, the Isley Brothers, Arthur Prysock, Stevie Wonder, and more than a thousand others. The Reverend C. L. Franklin, Aretha's father, directed the service. Stevie Wonder sang, the Kingpins played Soul Serenade, the Reverend Jesse Jackson spoke, and Aretha closed the service with the sadly appropriate gospel song, Never Grow Old. Duane was in no condition to contribute anything musical to the proceedings. He simply sat with the rest of the congregation, crying. On August 26, Duane was back at A&R, in the same studio where he and King Curtis had played with Delaney and Bonnie just over a month earlier. This time, it was the Allman Brothers band that had been booked for a live gig to be aired over WPLJ. The band whipped through its usual set list, Statesboro Blues, Trouble No More, Don't Keep Me Wondering, Done Somebody Wrong, One Way Out, In Memory of Elizabeth Reed, and Stormy Monday. After they finished the old T-Bone Walker song, Duane stepped up to the microphone and began to reminisce about King Curtis. Man, that was one of the finest cats there ever was, said Allman. He was just right on top of getting next to the young people, you know? It's a shame. Less than a week before the Allman Brothers broadcast, Curtis's latest album, Live at the Fillmore West, had been released to rave reviews. If y'all get a chance, Duane said, listen to that album he made out at Fillmore West. Boy, it's incredible. It's unbelievable the power and the emotional stature that man had. He was an incredible human being, boy. I hope that, well, that whatever it was that did it knows what he did. It was a terrible thing. At the funeral, Aretha sang and Stevie Wonder played, and man, they played Soul Serenade. At this point, Duane picked out the opening line of Curtis's 1964 hit single, You ever hear that? Y'all are probably a little bit young to know it. It's fantastic. As the crowd in the studio applauded in recognition, Allman said, Yeah, we'll do a little bit of that. He turned to the band and asked, You want to do some of that? Then softly, as if talking to himself, the guitarist said, I know where we'll do it. 
Then Allman begins playing the intro to You Don't Love Me. After Greg sings the first verse, Dwayne plays his heart out. It's an up-tempo solo filled with anger. Greg comes back for the second verse, followed by Dickie's solo turn, and then Greg's B3. After the third verse, Dwayne enters with another series of rapid licks before holding one long, sustained note until the rest of the band falls out. As Allman dramatically slows the tempo, there is an occasional drum roll or cymbal fill behind him. After each drawn-out guitar phrase, Oakley answers on his bass. Eventually, the drummers and Oakley stop and wait. Both band and audience listen to find out where Dwayne is going. As the seconds tick by, Dwayne Allman, alone on the stage, uses his guitar to pour out his grief. Through a series of musical twists and turns, he slowly segues into the introduction to Curtis's soul serenade. Greg's organ and Barry's bass join in at the perfect moment. Soon the drums are there, too. And like magic, the Allman brothers have turned into King Curtis's kingpins, with Duane taking the late saxophonist's part. The audience claps along to the loping beat. Once the statement has been made, the band goes into free time once more as Allman plays a slow gospel dirge. As soon as the last chord is over, he returns to You Don't Love Me. As always, just before the song comes to its resounding conclusion, Dwayne's guitar rings out with the melody line of joy to the world. The anger, sadness, and grieving are over. The king is dead. Long live the king. Chapter 20. The Final Tour Music is what keeps me together. It's the thing that keeps us all going. God, I've got no idea what I'd do if I wasn't playing. I don't know what would happen. D.A. Music industry veteran John Carter, known to everyone in the business as simply Carter, was Atlantic's West Coast promo man during Dwayne's years with the band. In today's terms, it would probably be called artist relations, says Carter. Back then, it was underground promotion. Carter's primary responsibility was to get Atlantic's records, and to a lesser extent those of its subsidiaries, played on the area's burgeoning FM radio stations. The West Coast was one of the main areas where those FM stations were, and there were more of them all the time, he says. Needless to say, in L.A. and San Francisco, they were strong. So it was my job to have radio station personnel at shows to get those records played that we weren't going to get played on pop stations. And things were working great. People couldn't believe the number of records the Allman Brothers were selling on what appeared, to the old school, as no airplay. But I knew that the small audience that was listening to those FM stations was religious about it. I was always on the road, touring with one of the Atlantic bands that was in my area, Carter recalls. As far as the Allman Brothers band was concerned, he says, I'm sure I saw every date they did on the West Coast during the last tour that Dwayne was with them. Although the Atlantic execs were clearly proud of their association with Phil Walden, when it came to promotion, the emphasis at Atlantic was, understandably, on the acts signed directly to Atlantic. Let's face it, says Carter, it was Capricorn. No one wanted to work those first two Allman Brothers records. There was no emphasis on those records at the time. They did what they did on their own. I think the Fillmore East record was recognized as a great record, so it took off. I was raving at the time that you had to come and see them because, unlike anyone else I'd ever seen, every night was different. It was the same set list, but I'd never seen a band that was so spontaneous and reacted so well to each other. They would let a song stretch because it just felt good tonight. 
Some nights, whipping post would be six minutes. And some nights, whipping post would be 15 minutes. And sometimes, it'd be 20 minutes. It was all about how we're feeling tonight. I've never experienced that in show business before. Today, with very lights and stuff, you've got to hit your cue. Every set is rigidly the same. But even in that era, a 45-minute set was 46 minutes tops, except for the Allman Brothers. It was absolutely real and spontaneous and driven by greatness. So I have to say that as far as doing the tour goes, to this day I have never been so blown away by an act. Having said that, it was also some of my worst moments where they were so fucking high that Barry would just fall over. He would fall over during the first song, and they'd drag him off stage. They'd all be cracked up and laughing, and Dwayne would say, why don't y'all just give us another 30 minutes? And 30 minutes later, they'd come back out and start playing. By the time of what would turn out to be Dwayne's final tour with the band, the thought that maybe the road really does go on forever was clearly taking its toll. A combination of boredom and chemical recreation led to actions that were simultaneously humorous and horrific. Carter recalls going to a hotel room someplace, knocking on Dwayne's door and rolling in. There were four or five guys in the room and a guy sitting at the table who was just as hardcore a hippie as you could possibly be with that real long little fingernail. The bag was sitting there, and I just walked into the room and strutted right over with one finger covering one nostril and the other flared. I got right over it. The guy's just sitting there waiting for me. And as I leaned over, Dwayne said, Cotta, that ain't cocaine. I wheeled around and went right back out of the room. And they all started laughing because they knew where I drew the line. Blow? Sure. Heroin? No. But they were doing it all the time. With little money to show for all his hard work and success, Dwayne Allman's outlook was still optimistic, and his southern sense of humor remained intact. Dwayne and I are smoking a joint in a hotel room, recalls Carter, and we'd been together long enough now that for some reason he's being very philosophical. And he says to me, Cotta, it's a rat race out there, but my rat's winning. Unlike The Who and many other bands who had become renowned for their hotel room destruction, the Allman Brothers band and road crew had devised a much less obvious manner of leaving their mark on their temporary living spaces. Every hotel room was trashed in a subtle way, says Carter. They would pull the drawers out of the dresser and throw knives through the dresser frame and then put the drawers back in so you didn't see that they had destroyed the fucking wall. A lot of knives, a lot of drugs. Today's rock stars still get busted occasionally for being caught in possession of one drug or another. But it would seem that modern-day recording artists and their followers don't have quite the same voracious habits as the rock generation of the 1960s and 70s. It's of the era, Carter says. I'm sorry to say it, but I was probably as guilty as anyone, using cocaine as a handshake. It was there. I'm saying cocaine, but obviously there were other things around. The drug scene was everywhere. I'm one of you. You're one of me. Let's get high. In the handful of interviews Dwayne gave during his two years and seven months with the Allman Brothers Band, his main thrust was almost always about the music. He would occasionally discuss what he was currently reading, and, of course, there was the unfortunate alcohol-fueled monologue on WABC-FM, but by and large, the subject was music, the blues and jazz he loved so much the sessions he played on as a sideman, putting the Allman Brothers band together, the thrill of playing with Clapton on the Layla album. He seldom spoke out on other subjects. 
But only two months before his death, he made a chilling statement about why bands sometimes break up. Drugs is one thing that will do it, and do it quick. I don't allow no shooting up in this band. I ain't putting up with none of that shit. I don't hold drugs against anyone. I just ain't having no one shooting up in this band. As was the case with Elvis Presley, Allman had apparently created his own set of standards to distinguish good drugs from bad drugs. For Elvis, if a doctor prescribed drugs to him, no matter what size the dosage or how many medications piled up, they qualified as good drugs. But illegal drugs were bad drugs. Dwayne Allman drew the line quite a bit further down the page. Just about everything, including snorted heroin, appeared to be on his good drugs list. But the moment a needle came out, as had happened with one of the band's roadies, the line was crossed. When guitar dealer Kurt Linhoff first met Allman in San Antonio in March 1971, he quickly discovered what it was like to live in Dwayne's world. I don't remember a whole lot about that night, he says, except going in the boys' room with Dwayne and doing some brown powder. Billy Gibbons introduced me to Dwayne, and Dwayne introduced me to heroin, all in the same night. But, the guitar dealer confirms, Dwayne Allman never, ever shot up. As Carter points out, drugs were simply a part of the scene. They were one of the identifying factors of a generation of young adults who thought alike. Along with flowered shirts, bell-bottom jeans, and long hair, drugs were one more item on the list that separated the youth from the authority figures that neither got it nor wanted to. In 1971, the divide remained wide. The war still raged in Vietnam. Richard Nixon was still in the White House. It didn't take too much chemical enlightenment, if any, to realize that all was not right with the world. John McEwen, a staunch anti-drug advocate, vividly recalls the era. I would say that in a time when the body counts were on television, kids were getting murdered on campuses, and the presidents were lying. Of course, some things don't change. In that time period, when America was in turmoil, the Allman Brothers, with Duane in the band especially, are one of the reasons that a lot of people in our age group call that time the good old days. The music helped transcend everything that was going on around you. Although McEwen avoided the drug scene, many of his contemporaries chose to partake. For them, both the music and the drugs were methods of temporary escape from the madness. In Duane's case, although one is left with only conjecture at this point, the causes for his drug use seem to have been multi-layered. When he was sniffing glue and smoking pot as a kid in Daytona Beach, a town with a population of well under 100,000 in those days, Duane might have suffered from the need to avoid the realities of being a bright young man with big dreams trapped in the confines of a small town with its corresponding mentality. Can you imagine being as talented as he was at a very early age in that small town with no way to get out? asked Alan Walden. During his early days on the road with the Almond Joys, working that garbage circuit of the South and making $150 a week, Duane would eat pills and drink just to keep going. Having little control over the music he was playing during the whole hourglass fiasco practically necessitated something to numb the mind and shield him from the miserable reality that he was compromising his talent. And then there was Muscle Shoals, a place so small that Daytona Beach must have seemed like New York City in comparison. In Muscle Shoals, you have a lot of creative people that never do anything beyond that studio, says Walden. Dwayne Allman was different in that he wanted to carry his music all over the country. In Muscle Shoals, you had these guys that wrote great songs and played great music, but they were very content sitting there in Muscle Shoals and being session players for the rest of their lives. 
This man had a dream that went beyond all of that. During the brief time he lived in his cabin by the lake in Alabama, Duane was as sedate as he would ever be. But he still managed to locate pot and speed, even in a dry county where you had to take a trip over the state line just to buy a beer legally. Later, in Atlanta and Macon, hallucinogens like mushrooms and LSD were easily available. And in Miami, during the Layla sessions, as Bobby Whitlock admits, that's when we all started entertaining our own devils. Perhaps more than anything else, though, it was the never-ending road life that caused band members and roadies alike to turn to harder drugs just to keep going. The great music the Allman Brothers created had gotten them the record deal Dwayne had dreamed of, which in turn gave him the chance to take his music to the people. But taking the music to the people meant the band had to stay on the road. Fans bought records. Fans wanted to see the band. The more fans there were, the more records the band sold. The more records they sold, the more albums had to be recorded to please both the record company and the fans alike. The more albums they recorded, the more fans wanted to see the band. It was a vicious cycle. There was no such thing as MTV or VH1 to keep the group in the public's collective eye while the band rested. The Allman Brothers had no choice but to take their music from town to town. The pace quickened, and the inevitable downward spiral began. It burned them out, says Johnny Townsend. Stardom can get to you after a little while. After they had gotten around to doing that Fillmore East album, which was just a giant record, they seemed to have reached a peak where they were pretty well toasted from being on the road. From the time the band recorded at Fillmore East until mid-October, with just that two-week break in August, the ABB had kept going, playing more than 70 shows, racing from coast to coast and back again. The last time I saw Duane was at the Atlanta airport in August of 71, says McEwen. He said, John, get out that banjo and pick me a tune. I said, well, Duane, we're kind of in the middle of the airport, you know. He said, if somebody doesn't like the banjo, they're not American. So I sat there and played for him for about 20 minutes. I think it helped take him away. The Allman Brothers leapt from a gig in Tuscaloosa, Alabama one night to a show in Minneapolis the next. Over the course of three nights, they played in Tennessee, Ohio, and New York. At times, their tour schedule appeared to have been put together by a booking agent without a map. It was no wonder that Barry Oakley was falling down. Even without drugs, it's amazing they could even get to the stage, much less stand up but the drugs were undeniably there and in ridiculous quantities. When it comes to your personal habit, you ration yourself according to your stash, explains Carter. But when you're a big star, people are going to use drugs to get close to you. And the next guy, and the next guy, and the next guy is going to get close to you too. Suddenly, you're doing ten times as much as you would if it was just you and your own stash. A month after Duane had run into John McEwen at the airport, the band was still on the road. They were playing in Texas, says Kurt Linhoff. So we got together, and Duane said, Come on the road. I'll pay you $75 a day to be my tech. I took him up on that. I ended up spending about $125 a day on heroin and cocaine. I remember we spent the night of September 27th in a motel in Austin. Barry was out of drugs and was having a horrible time. I had to get up in the middle of the night and drive to San Antonio to score for him. By early October, the band knew that a much-needed break was just a few days away. But first, there was a gig at the Whiskey A Go Go the very venue where Dwayne and Greg had first wowed the West Coast as members of the Hourglass. 
the very club where the brothers had first shown many of L.A.'s rock cognoscente that they were players to be reckoned with in a live setting, if not on the two albums they had done for Liberty Records. And it was the very place the Allman Brothers had been playing less than two years before when their debut album finally landed on the national charts. There were also two shows in San Francisco. Even after Bill Graham had closed both Fillmore's, he continued to book shows at Winterland, a 5,000-seat venue that Pete Townshend of The Who once described to author Robert Greenfield as the perfect size for a band to play. According to Greenfield, Bill kept Winterland open because, although he was unwilling to deal with the hassles of flying back and forth, from New York to San Francisco to oversee the operation of Fillmore's East and West, he was not about to stop promoting shows in the Bay Area. But when Graham decided to bring the Allman Brothers Band to Winterland in October 1971, he had unknowingly booked Duane for what would be one of the final concerts of his career. John Carter was there, as always, for the West Coast leg of the tour. I must admit that I thought I saw Dwayne declining, or at least I saw that Dickie Betts seemed to be taking over the band musically, he says. I mean, Dwayne was always the guy that spoke a lot in concerts. He was like the voice of the band. There were so many songs that were based on Dwayne's guitar work, and of course they were still great, but I think he was just tired and had been on the road too long. Chapter 21, A Guitar and a Motorcycle, Part 2 If you do something, you've got to be ready to pay those goddamn dues. I dropped three tabs of good red acid on a motorcycle going a hundred miles an hour down the road. No shoes and no helmet on. And, of course, you got to pay dues for stuff like that. D.A. Heroin use by many in the ABB camp finally reached, or perhaps even surpassed, epic proportions. Duane decided the time had come to either check into rehab or take the chance of watching everything that had taken so long to build up quickly come tumbling down. So after years of drug and alcohol abuse, around half of his life, in fact, 24-year-old Dwayne Allman, along with two other band members and a couple of roadies, took a trip to Buffalo in the fall of 1971, checking into Linwood and Bryant Hospital to dry out, clean up, and get ready to resume work on the band's next album. It was an exciting time for both the Allman Brothers and Capricorn Records. On October 25th, just as Dwayne was checking out of rehab, at Fillmore East went gold. Meanwhile, Capricorn was building a catalog around the Allman Brothers, releasing a string of albums by acts such as Wet Willie, Jonathan Edwards, Johnny Jenkins, Alex Taylor, Livingston Taylor, and Cowboy, a band that included Dwayne's old friend Scott Boyer from the 31st of February. After the demise of the 31st of February, Boyer had teamed up with singer-songwriter-guitarist Tommy Talton. Supported by a fluid lineup of other musicians, the duo formed Cowboy in Jacksonville in 1969. A short time later, Duane heard about Boyer's new group and decided to check them out, in his unique manner. He pulled up in our driveway about 7 a.m., recalls Boyer, he was on his way from Daytona back to Macon. He woke me up and said, I hear you've got a band. I said, yeah. And he said, well, play something for me. So I woke everybody up, and we went down into the music room and played a few songs for Dwayne. He said, okay, I like your stuff, man. I'm going to go back and talk to Phil Walden about it. I don't know what Dwayne told Walden, says Talton, but without Phil ever hearing or seeing us, we got publishing, recording, and management contracts in the mail. I've always meant to ask Phil, what in the hell did Dwayne say? 
But I don't really need to know. I know what it is. Phil respected Dwayne and his opinion on music. Apparently, it was enough for him that Dwayne said, man, these cats are doing something you might want to get involved in. Cowboy's first album, Reach for the Sky, was produced by Johnny Sandlin and released in February 1971. When the band began to work on the follow-up, Five Will Get You Ten, Allman decided to help out. They were having trouble getting the Capricorn studio in Macon to work right, and they decided to do a redesign, says Boyer. Johnny Sandlin didn't want to wait to cut our next album, so he talked Phil into buying some time at the Jackson Highway studio, Muscle Shoals Sound, and we went over there and recorded the Five Will Get You Ten album. Dwayne came in a week or so into the project. He flew down from New York City. We were in the studio recording Please Be With Me with Dwayne playing the dobro, and there was a buzz in the dobro. It was really bothering Johnny Sandlin. So the next day, Johnny called somebody, some guitar tech guy, who came in and fixed the dobro. We re-recorded it without the buzz. According to Johnny Weicker, there was more than one buzz going on. On the track that Dwayne played dobro on, he was snorting so much coke that if you listen real close, you can hear him sucking air up his nose to keep the coke drainage from coming out. His hands were busy playing, so he had to suck it up. We were laughing our asses off because you could hear him so loud on the track along with his dobro part. They might have doctored it out of the track, but it happened. I was there. When it came time to finish the album, says Boyer, I went to Johnny and said, I really like what Dwayne did more on the version with the buzz and the dobro, and the buzz doesn't bother me that much. So I talked him into putting the one I wanted onto the Cowboy album. A few years later, he was put in charge of doing Dwayne's anthology album. And he called me up and said, Look, I want to put Please Be With Me on here, but you've got to let me use the other version. I said, Fine, whatever. I'm just flattered to have something on there. Once Dwayne had completed his stint in rehab... It was almost time to go home. He wanted to get back in time for Linda Oakley's surprise birthday celebration at the big house. So in preparation for his return, he put in a phone call to Grover Sassaman at Harley-Davidson of Macon. His chopper needed new tires. He also decided to order a new helmet. Dwayne left the hospital and headed to Manhattan so he could spend some time hanging out with old friends including John Hammond, Jr. He had just come into New York from Buffalo, where he'd gotten his head together, Hammond told interviewer Jazz Obrecht. He was at the house of a friend named Deering Howe, and I got a call. I went over there, and we had a few beers. When it was time to leave, he came over to my loft on Broadway, and we played records and jammed on guitars all night. Hammond, whom Greg once described as Dwayne's best friend, was looking forward to eventually going back into the studio with Allman. He and I were talking about making another album together and doing some acoustic stuff. He really admired my slide playing on the National, resonator guitar. I couldn't believe it, but he did. The next day, Hammond says, I had to fly out to Newfoundland, and he went home to Macon. On October 28th, Dwayne flew back to Georgia. Greg and his new wife, Shelley, were at the airport to meet him. The next day, Dixie Meadows and Candace Oakley baked a cake for Linda Oakley's birthday party while Dwayne slept in. Later, he got a ride to the Harley-Davidson dealership to pick up his newly retired bike. Dwayne's cycle was a Harley-Davidson sportster, Grover Sassaman told writer John Ogden. It was a modified chopper with fork legs. He had bought it secondhand from a local kid. The extended forks increased the distance from the handlebars to the shock absorbers on the front wheels and hurt handling at low speeds. 
all the manufacturers highly discouraged them. As if that modification wasn't dangerous enough, Duane also modified his brand new helmet. He climbed on his bike, took the new helmet, and cut the chin strap in two, recalled Sassaman. I told him that wasn't a good idea, but he just smiled and rode off. Duane's motorcycle escapades in Macon were the stuff of legend. He had ridden Harley since his early days in Daytona Beach, and he was notorious for breaking every traffic law in the book. One night, the Macon police caught Duane out riding, Alan Walden says. He had no tag, no driver's license, no helmet, and he ran a red light. They pulled him over, found out who he was, and escorted him home. They told him, now, Duane, you stay home tonight. They caught his ass about 35 minutes later, running another red light. I don't think they were as kind to him that time. On October 29th, after picking up his bike, Allman rode over to the big house. Everyone was beginning to gather for Linda's surprise party. Since it was so close to Halloween, Duane spent some time cheerfully carving jack-o'-lanterns as he sat on the porch. Phil Walden, who was on vacation in Bimini at the time, would undoubtedly have been more than a little nervous to know that one of the guitar players for the biggest act on his label was whittling away on a pumpkin with a sharp blade. One wrong move and the new album the band had started working on a few weeks earlier could be indefinitely delayed. It was about half past five when a small caravan of two cars and a motorcycle got ready to head back to Duane's house to pick up the presents and the cake for a still unsuspecting Linda Oakley. Dixie and Candace were in one car, Barry was in the other. Duane was set to lead the way on his motorcycle. In a big screen movie version of Duane Allman's life story, this is the moment when the camera would zoom in on Duane's dog collared fry boot, kick starting the Harley. The engine roars to life. The camera pans out to show the guitarist astride his chopper, smiling as he looks back at the folks assembled in front of the big house. The sliced-in-half straps of his helmet slowly flap in the breeze. As the motorcycle sprays gravel on its way down Vineville Avenue, the camera follows a few feet behind for a block or two before coming to a stop, allowing us to watch the guitarist riding off into the sunset as the familiar introduction to Statesboro Blues begins to play. The motorcycle slowly disappears from view as the screen fades to black. Then a paragraph in large white letters. The epitaph from Duane's monument at Rose Hill Cemetery slowly scrolls up. I love being alive, and I will be the best man I possibly can. I will take love wherever I find it, and offer it to everyone who will take it. Seek knowledge from those wiser, and teach those who wish to learn from me. Duane Allman In the real world, there is no pretty way to tell the story. Duane rode his motorcycle west on Vineville, then turned south onto Pio Nono Avenue. Most drivers would stay on Pio Nono for about a half mile to Napier Avenue. A right turn on Napier leads straight to Burton Avenue, the street where Duane and Dixie lived. But Allman had resided in Macon for so long that he knew all the back roads and shortcuts. He needed that knowledge on those occasions when the local police had to be outrun. Rather than following Pio Nono all the way down to Napier, Allman made a sharp right turn onto Hillcrest Avenue, traveling west once more. At the intersection of Hillcrest and Bartlett Street, everything went wrong. A truck heading east on Hillcrest began to make a left turn onto Bartlett. Because motorcycles are much less noticeable than four-wheeled vehicles, every seasoned biker is used to having a car, truck, or bus turn left in front of him. Duane was no exception. As always, Allman was going much too fast, but he knew what to do. It was just a matter of swinging to his left, zipping past the truck on the wrong side of the road, and then quickly swerving back into the right lane 
to avoid any possible oncoming traffic. What happened in the next few moments is unclear. Duane might have tried and failed to squeeze his Harley between the truck and the curb, or he might have decided at the last second to lay the bike down. In any event, there was an impact violent enough to cause his unstrapped helmet to fly off. The bike hit the street so hard that it made holes in the pavement. After one bounce, the big Harley landed right on top of Allman and then skidded almost a hundred feet down Hillcrest before coming to rest on the curb, its engine still running. Candace and Dixie, following close behind, got to Duane within a matter of seconds. Candace ran to get help, but she had to go to three different houses before someone finally agreed to let her use their phone to call an ambulance. When help finally arrived, after what seemed like forever, according to one account, Duane was unconscious, but his external injuries were no more than a handful of scratches. Dixie thought he had escaped a close call, so it came as a shock to her as she rode along in the ambulance on the way to the hospital when Duane stopped breathing. One of the paramedics was able to revive him with mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Candace drove on to Duane's house, and oblivious Barry, who had taken the more obvious route to Burton Avenue, was still there waiting. She told the bassist what had happened, and then called Greg. The younger Allman's apartment was in such close proximity to the medical center of central Georgia that he took off in a dead run to be by his brother's side. As word spread about Duane's accident, his friends began showing up at the hospital. He was still unconscious, which was not a good sign. Dr. Charles Burton determined that surgery was the only option. Greg was sent home and Duane was wheeled into the operating room. Almost exactly three hours after the accident happened, Duane Allman was pronounced dead. Duane had suffered multiple internal injuries, including a ruptured coronary artery and a severely damaged liver both presumably caused by the 500-pound Harley landing on top of him. Red Dog was sent to Greg's apartment to deliver the tragic news. Dwayne's old friend John McEwen was on the road when he found out. At first, I was mad because I wasn't going to see him again, he says. Then I was mad that I hadn't spent more time around him. The Allman brothers had been doing well, and things were finally starting to happen for them. Hey, what could be better, right? When we heard that he had died, it was kind of like you just didn't want to think about it. It just didn't seem fair. Word of Allman's death soon hit the airwaves. Dwayne's daughter, Galadriel, and her mother, Donna, were on a camping trip in the Midwest when Donna was told the news by other campers. Campers who had no clue of her relationship to Dwayne. Donna and Galadriel immediately made their way to Macon, while Geraldine Allman flew up from Daytona Beach. By the day of the funeral, Monday, November 1st, many of the musicians who had been a part of Duane's life had arrived in town to mourn his death. Delaney Bramlett, Tom Doucette, Dr. John, Barry Beckett, Roger Hawkins, David Hood, Jimmy Johnson, and, of course, the five remaining members of the Allman Brothers Band were among the hundreds who filled Snow's Memorial Chapel. Before the funeral began, road manager Willie Perkins had the difficult job of ushering Duane's family and closest friends into a room adjoining the chapel so they could each see Duane, his casket open, one last time. Just prior to the service, the lid of the casket was finally closed but not before a Coruscant bottle had been slipped onto his ring finger and a joint placed in his pocket. The funeral began at three in the afternoon with Duane's guitar case and flower-covered casket in front of them. The Allman Brothers Band with Tom Doucette began the service by playing The Sky is Crying. They followed the Elmore James classic with Key to the Highway, one of the tunes that had featured Duane's slide work on Layla and other assorted love songs. 
Stormy Monday was next, a song Greg and his brother had played together since the Almond Joys days. Then came In Memory of Elizabeth Reed. Delaney Bramlett stepped up to the podium, leading the mourners in the old Carter family standard, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? It was a familiar melody that Duane had worked into Mountain Jam hundreds of times. Bramlett closed with Come On In My Kitchen, the Robert Johnson song on which Duane had played acoustic slide with Delaney and Bonnie less than four months earlier on WPLJ in New York. Greg then sat down with an acoustic guitar and sang Melissa, Duane's favorite of the many songs written by his little brother. I never much cared for it, said Greg, but I'm going to sing it for him. The band had already done the songs they had planned to perform in the service, but they couldn't seem to quit just yet. Greg, Barry, Butch, and J-Mo returned to their instruments, while Dickie picked up Dwayne's Les Paul and launched into Dwayne's familiar slide intro to Statesboro Blues. Jerry Wexler had been asked to give the eulogy. It wasn't an easy task for the man who, not even three months earlier, had attended the memorial service for another close friend. It was at King Curtis's funeral that I last saw Duane Allman, said Wexler. And Duane, with tears in his eyes, told me that Curtis's encouragement and praise was valuable to him in the pursuit of his music and career. They were both gifted, natural musicians with an unlimited ability for truly melodic improvisation. They were both born in the South, and they both learned their music from great black musicians and blues singers. They were both utterly dedicated to their music, both intolerant of the false and meretricious, and they would never permit the incorporation of the commercial compromise to their music, not for love or money. As he spoke, Wexler unsuccessfully fought back tears. I remember a magic summer night of music when Duane and Delaney sat on an outdoor patio overlooking the water, both playing acoustic guitars as softly as they possibly could, and both of them singing. Blind Willie Johnson, Robert Johnson, Jimmy Rogers, and an unforgettable Jimmy Davis song called Shackles and Chains. The music was incredibly pure, completely free of affect, and almost avoided personality as each of them gave himself over to the ineffable beauty of Southern gospel, country, and blues music as only Southern musicians can. The man who had gotten the call from Rick Hall only three years earlier, the music industry exec who, by listening to Dwayne's guitar playing through the receiver of his phone, could recognize greatness, then summed up Dwayne's too short life in one concluding paragraph. Those of us who were privileged to know Duane will remember him from all the studios, backstage dressing rooms, the downtowners, the holiday inns, the Sheratons, the late nights relaxing after the sessions, the whiskey and the music talk, playing back cassettes until night gave way to dawn, the meals and the pool games and fishing in Miami and Long Island, this young, beautiful man who we love so dearly, but who is not lost to us because we have his music, and the music is imperishable. Chapter 22, Eat a Peach I'm hitting a lick for peace, and every time I'm in Georgia, I eat a peach for peace. D.A. The funeral was over and the time had come for the remaining members of the band to make some serious decisions. We were originally going to take six months off and try to regroup, Butch Truck said in a conversation with Tom Dowd for Hitting the Note magazine. There was never any thought of not continuing, because Duane had given us the religion, and we were going to keep playing it. The Allman brothers, with their name taking on a figurative sense for the first time, returned to the road. They went out without a replacement as a five-piece band, says keyboardist Chuck Lavelle. That was an emotional time, 
not only for the members of the Allman Brothers, but for all of us that were in the making scene. Whether we were connected to Capricorn Records or whatever, it was a very emotional thing to see this great band carry on after such a prominent member had such a tragic demise. Muscle Shoals bass musician Stephen Foster was there when the five-piece version of the band performed at Auburn University shortly after Duane's death. The concert was personal and stunning and scary. When the time came for Duane's leads, the band just played rhythm and the crowd started singing Duane's leads. The band was in tears at times. The entire audience was in tears a lot of the time. 18,000 people singing a slide lead, singing the riffs to Statesboro Blues. It was amazing, almost a religious experience, and a poignant farewell to Duane. It showed clearly how devoted the fans were and how closely they had paid attention to his musicianship. I was blessed to be there and will never forget it. It gave me a whole new take on Duane's impact. In late November, the five-piece band played a series of dates in and around New York City, including two shows at Carnegie Hall on the 25th. On the day of the Carnegie Hall concerts, with an unfortunate combination of bad timing and bad taste, the latest issue of Rolling Stone hit the newsstands, featuring both a front-page obituary of Dwayne Allman and what it described as a candid account of a week on the road with the Allman Brothers Band. The obituary, written by John Landau, told of Duane's death in somber and respectful tones. But the so-called candid account, written by Grover Lewis, was an unflattering, smarmy piece that portrayed the Allman Brothers as nothing more than a bunch of backwoods rednecks who just happened to be pretty good musicians. Lewis referred to the band as Dixie Greasers, and the quotes he attributed to Duane and the rest were akin to dialogue from the movie Deliverance. Pretty became purdy. Thing became thang. Tired became tarred. Guitars became guitars, and so on. If the reader is to believe every quote is accurate, almost everyone said, I reckon, at one time or another. Greg suffered the most, with virtually every quote attributed to him being a mere parroting of whatever his older brother had just said. Lewis also chose to go into great detail about the band's consumption of piles of coke, an element of the story that would spell serious trouble for Greg a few years later. One person close to the band had suggested that the article was primarily a work of fiction. Whether or not it was an accurate assessment, and despite Lewis's decision to show the band in the worst possible light, there is one phrase that he got exactly right. Throughout the article, Lewis told of various band members and roadies using the expression, hitting the note. The phrase's appearance in the Rolling Stone piece prompted many an interviewer to ask the members of the original band to define it. Perhaps the best explanation was given by Butch Trucks during an interview with Kevin Spangler and Ron Kearns for the magazine that derived its name from the phrase. Hitting the note is reaching that point where you can't do any wrong, said Butch. With us, when we're playing music, it's where the brain goes away and the body just does what it's supposed to do. And there's no thought and there's no question and no matter what you do, it's right. It's getting to that spiritual level where the communication is total, but it's not mental. Spirituality has to be there, or it isn't music. I greatly adhere to the philosophy that what makes us human is that we have a brain and that we need to use it. And we need to not take too much on faith, and we should always be questioning and rational and thinking. Once you quit doing that, you're not human anymore. Then you're like some kind of cattle. What's happened with the great religions and the wars of the world tends to show that to be true. But something happens when you're playing music that kind of bypasses the brain and just goes straight to something else. 
Now, you have to use your brain to get it going. In order to play what we play, you know, there's thought. There's a lot of thought. But once it gets going, once that spark is lit, then everything starts flowing. And there's this unity, this spirituality, this communication that happens. And that's when you're hitting the note. By mid-December, the Five Feast Allman Brothers Band was back at Criteria trying to finish their next album. Three numbers, Blue Sky, Stand Back, and Dwayne's instrumental piece, Little Martha, were all they had in the can at the time of the guitarist's death. We knew that this was the last music Dwayne recorded, says Butch, and we knew we had to finish it up so that we could get it out to the people. Three songs don't make an album, and Greg and Dickie had only one new work apiece. Ain't wasting time no more, and... Le Brers and A Minor, respectively, ready to be recorded. Butch recalls, I talked with Greg and said that the one song that was Dwayne's favorite song ever was Melissa, and we had to do that one. Melissa, which Greg had sung at Dwayne's funeral, was one of the songs that had been recorded during the 31st of February sessions back in the late summer of 1968. Although a 31st of February album with the original version of Melissa would eventually be released in late 1972, the Allman Brothers Band's take of the song came out first, and it was far superior to the original. The group had no problems getting Melissa down, but Dickie's new instrumental, Le Brers in A Minor, was a different matter altogether. While the band had been away from Criteria, a new room, Studio C, had been added to the recording complex. According to Tom Dowd, when Mac Emmerman, who started and owned Criteria Studio here in Miami, built Studio C, it was a copy of the original Atlantic Studio we had up in New York. Emmerman built the room based on plans drawn up by Dowd, but there were a couple of minor changes and Mac had lined the walls in shag carpeting. This turned out to be a bad idea. It was absolutely the deadest room, says Butch. We got the intro done, but it was so dead that we had to do something. On Le Brer, there is a noticeable difference in the sound of the instruments from the intro to the meat of the song, because we finished it up after trying about eight times to do it in the other room in Studio A, which was this big, giant room. I think we got it in one take over there. We literally just picked everything up and dragged it all over to the other studio because we were getting nowhere in that dead room. A close listen to Le Brer's in A minor shows that more than just the ambiance changed when the band moved to Studio A. There is also a very slight pitch variation between the two parts of that song, recalled Dowd. Back in those days, the tape machines had a tendency to either run uphill or downhill, depending on where you were on the reel. So if you took something from the beginning of one reel and tried to splice it onto something that was at the end of another reel, you had big problems matching up the speed and the pitch of the instruments. In the end, Dowd decided that the pitch variation was not noticeable enough to require re-recording the intro. That problem overcome, the band moved on to Greg's new song, Ain't Wasting Time No More. It was a clear statement about his realization that death is an inescapable inevitability, that every day is precious. The relevance to recent events was evident when the band chose the song as the album's opening track. The Allman Brothers had six songs finished. It was better than three, but a long way from what they needed for an album. Plus, so soon after Dwayne's death, it was difficult to imagine releasing an album that featured him on only three cuts. The solution was to go back to the live recordings made at the Fillmore East. Tape had been rolling on June 27th when the band had appeared there for the hall's closing night. One highlight from that show was the classic Elmore James' Sonny Boy Williamson song, One Way Out. 
the band decided to add it to their album in progress, along with a version of Trouble No More from the March gig. With just about any other band of that era, and under normal circumstances, an album that was more than half an hour long would have been considered sufficient. But the Allman Brothers weren't just any band, and the circumstances were far from normal. So after listening to the remaining tapes of their Fillmore East appearances, the group decided to include their ultimate live showpiece, Mountain Jam. The only problem, says Butch, was that there was only one decent recording of it that was good enough to put out, but it was also one of the worst we ever played. We said we had to put that one out because it was Dwayne playing on it, and we had to use as much of his music as we possibly could at that point. Had Dwayne not died, Eat a Peach would have been just a single album and not what it ended up being. When Phil Walden showed Trucks the artwork for the album, he was knocked out by what Jim Flournoy Holmes and David Powell had created. But the title that Capricorn had chosen, The Kind We Grow in Dixie, wasn't to his liking at all. The title sucks, he told Walden. Then the drummer remembered a quote of Dwayne's from one of his last interviews. When the writer Ellen Mandel had asked Allman what he was doing to help the revolution, he responded, I'm hitting a lick for peace. Every time I'm in Georgia, I eat a peach for peace. But you can't help the revolution, because there's just evolution. I understand the need for a lot of changes in the country, but I believe that as soon as everybody can see just a little bit better and get a little hipper to what's going on, they're going to change it. Everybody will, not just the young people. Everybody is going to say, Man, this stinks. I cannot tolerate the smell of this thing anymore. Let's eliminate it and get straight with ourselves. I believe if everybody does it for themselves, it'll take care of itself. Call this thing Eat a Peach for Peace, Trucks told Walden. In the end, the title was whittled down to simply Eat a Peach. With that, everything seemed to be in place. But just before the album's release... Phil Walden made a business decision that remains a sore spot with Jerry Wexler to this day. Phil had an assistant named Frank Fentner, says Wexler. I had signed the Allman Brothers to a three-year distribution contract. At the termination of that contract, Fentner came up to New York to take them away and get them a different deal with Warner Brothers. Somebody once said I didn't want them anymore. Horseshit. Phil pulled the rug out from under me. I never called him on it, but he sent his man up to take them away and sign them to a bigger deal. What apparently was on his mind was that he couldn't get very much on a renewal deal with Atlantic because of our close association. His attitude was, let's go elsewhere where we can really bring the hammer down. They snatched a jewel, a gem, unconscionably away from me without explanation. Throughout the long career of the Allman Brothers Band, right to the present day, there have been moments when it seemed that the word irony was created just so there would be a way to describe the group's constantly changing fortunes. This was just such a moment. With the release of Eat a Peach in February 1972, the Allman Brothers' popularity surpassed everything that had preceded it. Dwayne Allman, only four months gone when the double album hit the record stores, was on the verge of having the biggest selling record of his career. Eat a Peach was on the charts by early March, eventually climbing to number four, nine spots higher than at Fillmore East. But ironically, there's just no other word to describe it. Even Eat a Peach the last album of those released in chronological order to contain tracks that included Dwayne, would pale when compared to what lay ahead. Chapter 23. The Allman Brothers Band, A.D. As soon as we get the money, as soon as we get famous and rich and get to be stars, we'll hire some more cats. D.A. 
Eda Peach brought many new fans into the fold, and the band toured heavily in early 1972. But as the year wore on, Greg began to seriously consider taking on a solo project. He had always been the band's primary songwriter, but he had begun to compose songs that simply didn't fall into the Allman Brothers' established style. Before the year was out, Greg headed into the studio to begin work on the tracks that would eventually make up his first solo album, Laid Back. He would call on many of his old friends to play on the recording sessions. Paul Hornsby and Johnny Sandlin, from his Hourglass days, both having worked at Capricorn Studios since 1969, Tommy Talton and Scott Boyer from Cowboy, David Brown from the 31st of February. Greg also invited Butch Trucks and j along with a host of other players, including, on some songs, a 40-piece orchestra. Another musician who was on hand for the laid-back sessions was the kid who had first heard Greg singing with the Almond Joys at Fort Brandon Armory in Tuscaloosa. Chuck Lavelle had come a long way since those days. I am playing piano professionally because of Paul Hornsby, Lavelle told John Linsky. I was 15 years old when I met Paul back in Alabama, and he took me under his wing. He always encouraged me. Hey, kid, you can do this. It's going to be fine. He taught me so much about keyboards and he also encouraged me to sing. I was shy about it, but Paul somehow made me comfortable. I was just a kid, but Paul treated me like an equal. He gave me a break, and that meant a lot to me. I love him for that. When he left for Macon, I was devastated. My big brother, my mentor, was going away. It freaked me out. So the logical solution was to find out where the hell Macon, Georgia was and go join him. I ended up in a couple of bands that quite often opened concerts for the Almonds. One was with Alex Taylor, James Taylor's elder brother, after that with Dr. John. I always insisted on an acoustic piano for our sets, and then our equipment would be pulled back and the Almond Brothers would set up and play. Some of the guys in our band would go back to the hotel room or go off to do whatever. But I always liked to hang around and hear the Almonds play. I'd sit there at the piano backstage, and while the Almonds were doing their concert, I'd play along. By doing that, I got familiar with a lot of their tunes. That familiarity began to pay off for Lavelle in late 1972. I got a call from Johnny Sandlin to come in and play on Greg Allman's solo album. Johnny was co-producing the album with Greg. We recorded a couple of songs for Laid Back, but sometimes, during the course of the recordings, the rest of the Allman brothers would come down and we'd have these jam sessions. With Greg in the studio, the band was off the road for once, but the urge to play kept pulling them back together and the jam sessions were all they needed as an impetus to start working on the next ABB album. However, it was clear that a new direction was necessary. Thanks to the Fillmore tapes, as well as the songs that had been recorded before Dwayne's death, Eat a Peach sounded like an album made by the same band that had cut the three previous Allman Brothers albums. But there would be no more contributions from Dwayne Allman there was also no possible way to replace him. The time had come for the remaining band members to step up if the group was to survive. There was no alternative. The Allman Brothers Band had already seen what happened when key members of other bands had passed away. After the Doors lost Jim Morrison, their recording career was virtually over. On the other hand, the Rolling Stones' greatest successes would come years after original member Brian Jones was found dead in his swimming pool. The situation with Duane was unique. He had been the band's founder and leader, the person who got the band their record deal with Capricorn, the man who spoke between songs on stage, 
and the guitarist whose incredible musical talent created a genre of Southern music that other musicians and other bands continue to emulate to the present day. Despite all of those things, he had never been the band's voice. With the exception of Dimples, Dwayne wasn't a vocalist during his time with the ABB. That being the case, the remaining members knew there was a chance they could go on simply because the record-buying public was familiar with the singing voices of Greg Allman and Dickie Betts. It wasn't like the situation the Doors were in after Morrison died. Dwayne's role had been different. As Butch said, Dwayne had given them the religion. It was the band's mission to keep on proselytizing, spreading the word, and adding new converts to the flock. The band members knew better than to try to replace the Messiah of their musical religion. He was gone, and there would be no second coming. They would simply have to find an alternative. And when Chuck Lavelle started jamming with the Allman Brothers during breaks from Greg's solo album, the light bulb went on. One thing led to another, and the sessions started feeling pretty good, recalls Chuck. Within two weeks, I got a call to go into the offices of Phil Walden. I walked in for this meeting, and there's all the Allman Brothers band. There's Phil Walden. I'm this kid who was, at the time, barely 20 years old, and next thing I know, I'm asked to be in the Allman Brothers band. After picking myself up off the floor, I said, Yeah, I'd like to do that. For the first time since the band's formation in March 1969, the Allman Brothers had inducted a new member. Logic would seem to have dictated a move more along the lines of Tom Doucette. Much of what Duane had played over the years was so strongly reminiscent of a blues harp sliding notes that bringing a harmonica player into the lineup could have maintained much of the band's sound without the potential backlash of trying to replace Duane with another slide guitarist. But Chuck's involvement with Greg's solo session was fortuitous, and the decision to bring him into the fold was a stroke of musical genius. Chuck came into the ABB at a very rough, rough time, says Greg. As I look back on it now, his coming with the band helped everyone concerned, musically and otherwise. The band was so excited about the new lineup that Greg's solo album was set aside for the moment while the Allman Brothers started working on their next record. The sessions began in earnest in October 1972. Once again, Greg and Dickie had new songs ready to get the project underway. Greg's latest was called Wasted Words while Dickie's new one was the song that would lift the Allman Brothers from the ranks of underground FM bands and carry them the biggest hit of their entire career. We were recording every night down there at Capricorn Studios, says Lavelle, and Dickie had Ramblin' Man. We all kind of thought, wow, this is a country tune, but it's a cool country tune. Even so, there was a feeling at first of... Does this really belong on the record? Looking back through the mist of the decades that have passed, it's impossible to imagine the Allman Brothers passing up the chance to record the song. It would prove to be the band's biggest hit single, although no one knew that at the time, of course. But it's understandable that the decision to go ahead with Ramblin' Man must have seemed like a gamble, as there was nothing they had done before with the possible exception of Blue Sky, that was such a departure from the blues-based works that made up the bulk of the band's repertoire. We laid it down, says Lavelle, and with me having just come into the band, a lot of those runs, like the intro lick and the lick before the guitar solo, all of a sudden there was a piano playing in those harmonies as well as the guitar. But something was obviously missing even though the decision had already been made to avoid the trap of trying to fill Dwayne's shoes, the song simply cried out for those familiar twin guitar lines. I remember that Dickie felt a little uneasy, says Chuck, so he wanted to have another guitar. Dickie knew just the guy. 
A few weeks earlier, two musicians had arrived in Macon to jam with the Allman Brothers' remaining guitarist. At that time, especially with Greg working on a solo project, Dickie was thinking about forming a side band to play in when the Allman Brothers weren't in the studio or on the road. After all, Greg hadn't called on Dickie to help with his solo project, even though he was using both j and Butch. The two musicians Dickie had jammed with were keyboard player Peter Schles, an old acquaintance of Dickie's, and guitarist Les Dudek. Betts had been impressed by what he'd heard in Dudek's playing, so when it came time to record Ramblin' Man, he asked the teenage guitarist to play on the session. So it was two guitars and a piano doing those lines, says Chuck. We recorded the tune, and I was invited to sing on the choruses, sing a harmony part. So I found my part, and we went in and recorded the harmonies. We had a lot of fun with it. The band also recorded Greg's Wasted Words, which would become the album's opening track. It was early November 1972. There were two songs in the can, and all signs pointed toward a band bouncing back and moving forward. It had been a year since Dwayne's death, and everyone in the studio was beginning to feel positive about the future of the Allman Brothers Band. During Dwayne's days with the band, his leadership had never been challenged. Once he was gone, the burden of being in charge inevitably had to fall on somebody else's shoulders. In many bands, the lead singer is the natural leader, but that had never been the case with Greg. I had never been around a group where the lead singer was so on the side of it all, says John Carter. He's an amazing vocalist and a fantastic player, but he just hid behind his keyboard. Like the other members of the Allman Brothers, Greg had always followed his brother's direction. In fact, he had done that all his life. Barry Oakley had always been the most organized one of the group. Back in his Jacksonville days, he had acted as manager of the Second Coming. Barry had also been the one who put the jams together at Willow Branch Park, always making sure everything was in order. And he had been very close to Dwayne since those Jacksonville days, the one Jacksonville guy Dwayne chose to bring up to Muscle Shoals to play on his solo sessions at Fame. Although Barry was the youngest member of the band before Chuck Lavelle came on board, the others often looked to him for guidance. After they had moved into the big house, Barry was the one who organized the meals. No small task for at least half a dozen adults and two children. As his sister Candace once put it, Barry was the master of ceremonies to everyone. After Dwayne's death, he had even become the band's spokesman on stage. The more time that passed after Dwayne was gone, the more it became apparent that Barry was seen by the others as the one to pick up the mantle. It was a great honor for the bass player, but also a heavy burden. Those who knew Barry well have said that he was incapable of getting over what had happened to Dwayne. The loss was simply too great for him to bear. Even though he had gotten high enough to fall off the stage on at least one occasion, the kind of thing that some might have taken as a sign to cut back a bit, Barry kept on drinking and drugging. Barry started getting really, really messed up, j told John Linsky. He was having a rough time with himself because he didn't know what to do with the whole situation. It just ate him up, man. We didn't know what was happening with Barry. We didn't know if he was going nuts or what. He was drinking like two-fifths of vodka a day, crazy stuff like that. He was really disturbed about what was going on, and he missed Duane so much. I remember calling Lamar Williams and telling him how worried I was about Barry and everything that was going on. And then, a couple of weeks later, the accident happened. The bass player had begun to have nightmares. He immersed himself in the music of Delta Blues singer Robert Johnson, and was soon telling his wife that there were hellhounds on his trail. Somehow, though, through the haze of drugs and alcohol and mental anguish, Oakley managed to keep his organizational skills intact, 
to the very end. Chuck Lavelle recalls, I was living out at Idlewild South with Scott Boyer and David Brown. On the day that Barry died, there was to be this jam session at a place called the Ad Lib in Macon. Barry came out, and as I recall, Rhodey's Tuffy Phillips and Kim Payne were with him. And they were pretty lit up, you know. But they were excited, and Barry told us, we're going to have the B.O. Jam tonight, and we want y'all to come. The full name of the bass player's local jam session was actually Barry Oakley's Jive Ass Review, featuring the Rowdy Roadies and the Shady Ladies, understandably shortened to the B.O. Jam among the musicians. He invited me and Scott, continues Lavelle, and then he said, we're going to have a little rehearsal at the big house in a couple of hours, so if you want to come, we'll be there. And then they split. This was exciting news to us, and to me especially. So I said, okay, I'm ready. A couple of hours later, we got in the car. I had a Burgundy 65 Olds Cutlass station wagon, and we drove over to the big house for the rehearsal. As Chuck was driving toward the big house, Barry was on his Triumph 750 motorcycle going east on Napier Avenue. Kim Payne was riding next to him. They were on their way to the big house as well. Barry and Kim were playing around on their bikes, one passing a car on the right side while the other passed it on the left. Despite his antics that day, Barry had never been as skilled at riding a motorcycle as some of the other band members and roadies. The basic principles of riding a motorcycle are relatively simple. Accelerate by turning the throttle with the right hand, shift gears by pulling in the clutch with the left hand and pushing down or pulling up the shift lever with the left foot, control the front brake with the right hand, activate the rear brake with the right foot. One of the hardest things to master, though, is making a sharp turn at high speed. The sharper the turn, the more the rider must lean in the direction of the turn. Just leaning isn't enough. In fact, one has to lean while turning the front wheel in the opposite direction. That is, counter-steering. To cause the bike to turn right, the motorcyclist must turn the front wheel slightly to the left while leaning the bike to the right. Leaning a bike that weighs several hundred pounds while simultaneously counter-steering can be pretty unnerving for a novice because it sometimes feels that the bike might go down on even the slightest of turns. Going east on Napier Avenue, there is a sharp curve to the right just as one approaches Inverness Avenue. On November 11, 1972, as Barry was nearing Inverness, a city bus was heading west on Napier. The driver saw that the motorcycle was on his side of the road. Even though the bus driver swerved to his right and hit the brakes, Barry failed to lean far enough into the curve to avoid hitting the side of the bus. The impact was so severe that he was thrown almost 60 feet down Inverness. The momentum of the Triumph as it bounced off the side of the bus sent it in the same direction, and it landed right on top of Oakley, precisely what had happened to Duane. When Kim Payne got to Barry, he found the external damage to be minimal. The bassist's nose was bleeding and his helmet was cracked. Despite the powerful impact of being hit by a bus, or more accurately, despite the bus being hit by Oakley's motorcycle, Barry was able to stand up. Being less than a mile and a half from the big house, he decided to catch a ride home rather than go to the hospital. When Barry got back to the big house, Scott Boyer reports, he had a little tiny hole in his forehead. He said, I dropped my bike on the way home. He was all bummed out about it, but he said, let me go upstairs and change clothes and we'll go down and jam. A short time later, says Chuck Lavelle, Red Dog and some of the other guys were bringing Barry down the stairs, and he was in obvious agony and pain. The women of the house were all excited, and there was a lot of commotion going on. They told me, he's out of his head. We've got to get him to the hospital. I said, let's go. 
We loaded him in my station wagon and got him to the hospital as quickly as we could. Oakley was admitted to the hospital a few minutes before 3 p.m. He was pronounced dead less than an hour later. The cracked helmet, the hole in his forehead, and the nosebleed were all clues to his demise. Barry Oakley had fractured his skull, resulting in hemorrhaging of the brain. Although it didn't make anyone feel any better, the doctors who worked on him would later state that it would have made no difference if Barry had been brought to the hospital sooner. He had been mortally injured the moment the accident happened. Barry died one year and 13 days after Duane. The two motorcycle accidents had taken place within four blocks of each other. As had been the case with Duane, Barry Oakley was only 24 at the time of his death. The irony of the situation did not stop there. Duane had not yet been laid to rest. Just prior to Barry's accident, Donna had returned to Macon to finally resolve the matter of Duane's burial. Now that Barry was gone as well, the sad solution was obvious. As they had done night after night, sharing a hotel room on the road, Duane Allman and Barry Oakley would lie next to each other once again, this time in Rose Hill Cemetery. Only a few days after Allman and Oakley were buried, Capricorn Records released the first of two collections featuring the guitar work of Duane Allman. Entitled An Anthology, the double album opened with B.B. King medley from the Hourglass Sessions at Fame and included Going Down Slow from Duane's unreleased solo project, as well as tracks by Clarence Carter, Wilson Pickett, Aretha Franklin, King Curtis, Delaney and Bonnie, Derek and the Dominoes, the Allman Brothers Band, and others. More than a year after his death, Duane's popularity was at an all-time high. The record climbed into the top 30 on the album charts and before the year was out, it had gone gold. Meanwhile, the Allman Brothers Band played on. Auditions for a new bass player got underway in late 1972, and the five remaining members unanimously chose J-Mo's old friend, Lamar Williams, the man whom J-Mo had called to express his concerns about Barry only days before the accident. Wasted Words and Ramblin' Man had already been recorded before Barry's accident. So the Allman Brothers, with Williams on bass, cut another song by Greg, Come and Go Blues, and three more by Dickie, Southbound, Pony Boy, and a resounding instrumental called Jessica that featured Les Dudek on acoustic guitar and an inspired piano solo by Chuck Lavelle. The band also recorded a traditional blues called Jelly Jelly. As soon as the sessions were over, the band was back on the road playing shows from New Haven, Connecticut to Ontario, California, and then heading east again, arriving at Watkins Glen, New York, in late July for the biggest single show in rock and roll history to that point. Billed as a day in the country with the Allman Brothers Band, the Grateful Dead, and the band, it drew a crowd that had swelled to some 600,000 people by showtime. Watkins Glen with the brothers will always stand out as a special moment in time for me, Lavelle once said. It was incredible, not only for the number of people that were there, but for the event itself. The Grateful Dead, the band, the jam with all of us, it was a natural high. The following month, the new ABB album, Brothers and Sisters, was released as well as a single of Ramblin' Man. Just as the Eat a Peach cover had included the line dedicated to a brother, Dwayne Allman, the new record included the sadly similar phrase dedicated to a brother, Barry Oakley. Whatever response the band might have expected, it's doubtful anyone was prepared for the unprecedented success of both the album and the single. Having played to more than half a million people a few weeks earlier, no doubt helped to spur sales, but when the Brothers and Sisters and Ramblin' Man hit the stores in August, there seemed to be a race to see which would reach the summit of its respective chart first. The LP won, hitting the number one spot on the Top Pop Albums chart on September 8th, 
and remaining there for an incredible five weeks. On October 13th, Ramblin' Man peaked at number two on the singles chart, denied the coveted top spot by a 45 called Half Breed, recorded by, of all people, Cher. Chapter 24. Decline, Fall, and Resurrection I'm not going to sit back and watch this whole thing go down the tubes. D.A. After the success of Brothers and Sisters and its hit single Ramblin' Man, Greg resumed work on Laid Back. Dickie began recording his own solo album as well. In both cases, there was no thought at the time of leaving the group that had gotten them to where they were. Instead, they each had musical points to make outside the confines of the Allman Brothers Band. In Greg's case, Laid Back would even include two songs the band had already recorded, Midnight Rider and Please Call Home. According to Greg, both songs were originally written and arranged the way they appear on my solo record. When he had presented them to the ABB, Everyone contributed their own kind of style, their own feel, their own parts. But on Laid Back, Greg was able to record the songs his way. The Allman Brothers' single of Midnight Rider had failed to score on the pop charts in 1970, but Greg's solo take of the song became a genuine hit, reaching the top 20 in the early weeks of 1974. Rolling Stone, Billboard, Stereo Review, and other music magazines raved about Laid Back, with most critics agreeing that the new version of Midnight Rider was a serious improvement over the original. Like Greg's album and Brothers and Sisters before it, Dickie's Highway Call was co-produced by Johnny Sandlin. Both Allman and Betts included Sandlin, Tommy Talton, and Chuck Lavelle among the players on their solo efforts. But Dickey took a different approach stylistically. While Laid Back remained in the R&B, rock and roll pop vein, Dickey's initial solo project focused on his roots. Dickey wanted to go in a country direction, says Lavelle, using players like Vassar Clements on fiddle and John Huey on steel guitar but with his own personal twist to the music. The album also included a southern gospel group, The Rambos, on background vocals. The original LP was split in half, with the vocal selections on side one and the instrumentals on side two. Several singles were released, but none of them garnered much airplay. Highway Call came out in August 1974, as did Duane's An Anthology, Volume 2, and it eventually climbed to number 19 on Billboard's Top Pop Albums chart. The second Sky Dog Anthology didn't fare as well as the first, peaking at number 49. As good as it was, critics and record buyers alike felt Duane's finest work had already been presented in the previous two records set. Before Dickie's album was released, Greg had already put together a huge ensemble and begun a tour to promote Laid Back, simultaneously recording a live album that would result in his second solo release that October. In an unselfish move not at all typical of the times, the Greg Allman tour album included two songs by Cowboy, the band that opened the shows. That tour was just wonderful, recalls Tommy Talton. We played all the best venues in every large city in the United States. We did 35 gigs in 50 days, from Providence, Rhode Island, to Seattle, San Diego, Chicago, Memphis, Atlanta, Miami, Tampa, Jacksonville, and everywhere in between. Cowboy would start out the show and we would play for an hour or so. Then we would take a short intermission and come back to support Greg. Although the album didn't go gold, as its predecessor had done, the Greg Allman tour sold over 200,000 copies, a respectable number for a live two-record set. 
While Dickie and Greg were touring, both found themselves obliged to deny rumors that the Allman Brothers had fallen apart. Although it was true that the band was still together, it was on shaky ground. That became obvious in early 1975 when they gathered at Capricorn Studios to work on the next ABB album. They began by recording a Muddy Waters song, Can't Lose What You Never Had. But then things started going downhill fast. In a move reminiscent of the days following the demise of the Hourglass, Craig took off for Los Angeles. While sitting in with Etta James one night at the Troubadour, he spotted Cher in the audience. Within two days, they were dating, and within a matter of months, on June 30th, 1975, to be exact, they were married. Greg stayed in Los Angeles with Cher, recording most of his vocals for the new Allman Brothers album at the record plant. Like Brothers and Sisters, the new album was jointly produced by Johnny Sandlin and the Allman Brothers Band. Entitled Win, Lose, or Draw, it was released in August. Along with the Muddy Waters cover and Sweet Mama by Billy Joe Shaver, there were two new songs by Greg and three by Dickie, including High Falls, a Betts instrumental that clocked in at more than 14 minutes. It had been two years since the band's last album. Although the public hadn't forgotten about the Allman Brothers, the long time between releases and the solo albums by Greg and Dickie had unquestionably contributed to a slowing of the band's momentum. In addition, Win, Lose, or Draw didn't have a single with the catchiness of Ramblin' Man or an instrumental with the power of Jessica. In fact, there would be only one single. Nevertheless, backed with Louisiana Lou and Three Card Monty John. Both sides of the 45 would hit the pop singles chart, but neither would come close to making the top 40. Despite the album's shortcomings, not the least of which was the fact that Greg's vocals literally sounded more distant than on previous releases, Win, Lose, or Draw made it to number five on Billboard's Top Pop Albums chart, eventually selling more than half a million copies. And then the bottom fell out. Thanks in part to Grover Lewis's 1971 Rolling Stone article, as well as a People magazine piece that described Cher's attempts to keep Greg off heroin, the federal government had taken an interest in the Allman Brothers' relationship to the men behind the making drug scene. In 1975, a local pharmacist, Joe Fuchs, and the band's security director, John Scooter Herring, were brought up on charges of conspiracy to distribute narcotics. Fuchs was quick to plead guilty, but Herring decided to fight the charges. When the case went to trial in June 1976, Greg was brought in to testify against one of his own. Rather than hide behind the Fifth Amendment, he admitted to having purchased drugs from Herring on a number of occasions. Greg's decision to testify against a member of the Brotherhood was considered an affront to Dickey, Butch, Jamo, and the rest. Dwayne's 1971 statement that drugs is one thing that will break up a band and do it quick had turned out to be an eerily accurate prediction of precisely what would happen. Halfway through 1976, the Allman brothers went their separate ways. Without its flagship act, Phil Walden's label was in trouble. Walden's solution was to try to recreate the success of At Fillmore East by putting together another live two-record set. The tracks were taken from Allman Brothers concerts ranging from a 1972 New Year's Eve show at the Warehouse in New Orleans to an October 1975 concert at the Oakland Coliseum. Although the recorded sound suffers due to a less-than-stellar mix, in a kind of strange admission, the credits thank Sam Whiteside for his remixing efforts, much of the music is surprisingly good, although the band members were not enthusiastic about the release. J-Mo once said, When that record came out, I didn't want to hear it. 
I didn't take the time to listen to it because we were very unhappy that the record company chose to put out an album mostly made up of different versions of songs that had already been released. Unlike at Fillmore East, which had only two songs that had previously appeared on ABV albums, and upon which the live versions were vast improvements over the originals, the new album was made up entirely of songs that had already been on earlier Allman Brothers LPs. In Memory of Elizabeth Reed made its third appearance on vinyl, although this was only the band's seventh album. And then there was the matter of the album's title. Wipe the windows, check the oil, dollar gas. In the history of rock, it has to rank as one of the worst-named records of all time. Despite its poor mix, repetitive song selection, and inane title, the new album did show off the positive contribution made by the band's revised rhythm section. J-Mo says, The record company was just trying to make some quick money, and I ignored the album. A few years later, a friend of mine in Atlanta was talking about the great playing on that album and told me I should really give it a listen. So I finally did, and I was blown away by what I heard. The stuff that Chuck, Lamar, and I were playing, we were out there, man. Despite all the nonsense that was going on, Chuck, Lamar, and I were having a ball. We three were really locking on, and we were basically playing around Dickie, Greg, and Butch, supporting them, but really playing off each other. It was so much fun, man. There's some damn good playing on there, and if you think about all the stuff that was going on, it's even more amazing that we could play that well. I mean, the walls were coming down, man. I think it's a damn fine record, especially in terms of what Lamar, Chuck, and I were doing. Unfortunately for the band and its financially strapped label, the fans saw the album for exactly what it was, a semi-desperate attempt by Capricorn to pump out product by a defunct act. After the album was released in late 1976, it crawled to number 75 on the album charts and then fell off completely after only 10 weeks. The label didn't even bother to release a single. While Greg and Dickie were now focused on their solo careers, the other former members of the band began to consider their futures. Three of them had already begun playing together apart from the band while the Allman Brothers were still together. During the years that I was with the Allman Brothers, which would have been 72 through 76, J-Mo and Lamar Williams and I had a little side band, says Chuck LaBelle. We just loved to play. We'd play all the time. We played at people's parties. We played at J-Mo's house. We played at my house. We played anywhere we could. One time, the Allman Brothers were playing in Boulder, Colorado, and we looked out the hotel window and saw this big field. J-Mo called up Red Dog and he said, Augie, we used to call him Augie Doggy. He said, Augie, go get my drums and get Chuck's keyboard and get Lamar's bass and a couple of amplifiers and as many extension cords as you can and run them out in the middle of that field out there. We're going to go play. And we did. We would do things like that at the drop of a hat. We were known as We Three. That's what JMO called us, We Three. When the Allman Brothers broke up in 76, we sat there in a room and said, why don't we carry on with We Three? We decided the trio was nice, but it might be good to have a guitar player. So I said, I know this guy in Washington, D.C., Jimmy Knowles. He played with us in Alex Taylor's band. J-Mo said, yeah, I remember Jimmy. Let's get him down. So we got Jimmy. We played, and it felt wonderful. They decided to call the quartet Sea Level, a none-too-subtle wordplay on the keyboardist's name, C. Lavelle. We talked about a producer, and Stuart Levine's name came into play, says Chuck. 
Stewart was known at the time for recording all those great jazz Crusaders records, and we wanted to go in that direction a little bit. So we were fortunate to get Stewart to produce. We made the deal with Capricorn, and that was the first record. Sea Level was recorded at Capricorn Studios in late 1976. It was released in February of the following year and climbed to number 43 on the album charts. A jazz-tinged project, it was more in a fusion direction, says J-Mo, not getting into fusion but flirting with it. The album was a great beginning for the band. After the breakup, Butch was the only former member who decided to get completely away from the madness of the music business. He left Macon and headed back to Florida, re-enrolling at Florida State University and making plans for a future that would no longer revolve around the band that had dominated his life for the last seven years. At least that was his plan. Dickie Betts, now on his own, decided to leave Phil Walden's record label, management, and publishing company behind. He hired Steve Masarski as his manager and got himself and his new band, Great Southern, a record deal with Clive Davis's New York-based Arista Records. Along with Dickie on guitar, slide guitar, and lead vocals, the band consisted of Dangerous Dan Toller on guitar and background vocals, Ken Tibbetts on bass, Tom Broom on keyboards and background vocals, and Jerry Thompson and Donnie Charbono on drums and percussion. It was obvious that the instrumental lineup was identical to that of the original Allman Brothers band, and their first album, Dickie Betts and Great Southern, even included a blues harp player, Topper Price, among the guest artists. Also on hand were Mickey Thomas, lead vocalist on the Elvin Bishop Band's hit Fooled Around and Fell in Love, and later a member of Jefferson Starship on background vocals, and a little-known actor named Don Johnson singing background vocals on Bougainvillea, a song he co-wrote with Betts. The album was produced entirely by Dickie. Dickie Betts and Great Southern was recorded at the Allman Brothers Old Haunt, Criteria Studios in Miami. Singles were released, including Bougainvillea, but pop radio just didn't seem interested. Even so, Dickie and his new band proved to be a popular live act, and their debut album, released in early 1977, reached number 31 on the Top Pop Albums chart. While Dickie was recording in Miami, Greg was making his next solo album at Warner Brothers Studio in Hollywood with a new group that was now called simply the Greg Allman Band. The musicians were Ricky Hirsch of Wet Willie fame, Steve Beckmeyer and John Hug on guitars, along with keyboardist Neil Larson, bassist Willie Weeks, and drummer Bill Stewart. Among the host of folks credited as additional musicians on the album was Dwayne's old friend, Mac Dr. John Rebenack, on piano and clavinet. As he had done on his previous solo albums, Greg covered an Allman Brothers song. This time it was Come and Go Blues. Johnny Sandlin was out of the picture for now, so Lenny Waronker and Russ Teitelman handled the production duties. Although they were both skilled music men with proven track records, Waronker and Teitelman brought a certain slickness to the project that didn't entirely mesh with Greg's rough-edged vocals. The record, Playing Up a Storm, got mixed reviews when it was released in May 1977. It reached number 42 on the charts, but the single, Crying Shame, went unnoticed. When the dust had settled if it settled at all, in the chart wars, Dickie Betts came out the winner among the first batch of post-ABV releases. As one might have expected, none of the former band members' albums made the kind of impression on the public that the Allman Brothers Band's recordings had done. It was a classic case of the sum being greater than its parts. In the spring of 1977, Greg and Cher decided to record a duet album. 
Calling their act Almond and Woman, they cut 11 songs at sessions that took place at the record plant and Sunset Sound in Los Angeles. The album was called To the Hard Way, and this time around, Johnny Sandlin was back to produce much of the material. Despite what seemed like a highly unlikely mix of vocal styles, To the Hard Way actually worked well musically, especially on Greg and Shear's version of Michael Smotherman's Can You Fool? The album, released in the fall, was a combination of familiar classics, from Smokey Robinson's You've Really Got a Hold on Me to Lieber and Stoller's Love Me and new songs by writers like Dwayne and Greg's old friend, Johnny Townsend, among others. The singles were Move Me and You've Really Got a Hold on Me. Neither did anything on the charts. Listening to the album more than two decades later, it seems inexplicable that Can You Fool wasn't released as a single. It took country crossover star Glenn Campbell's record label to realize the song's potential. Campbell's version of Can You Fool became a top 40 hit a year after Greg and Cher's version of the song was released as just another album track on To the Hard Way. Except for some kind words from Billboard and a handful of others, the critics lambasted To the Hard Way. Maybe it was hard to get past the album cover photo of a shirtless Greg draped over a tube-topped Cher and knee-high boots. The supermarket tabloids' constant reportage of their problem-plagued relationship probably didn't help either. The end result was an album stillborn. Near the end of 1977, Greg and Cher separated. Around that same time, Dickie Betts was doing a little separating of his own. When he went in to record his second album for Arista, Atlanta's Burning Down, all of the original members of Great Southern were gone except for Dan Toller and Donnie Charbono. The new members were Michael Workman on keyboards and vocals, David Brooke Goldfleece on bass, and Dan Toller's brother, David Frankie Toller, on drums and percussion. Topper Price was once again among the guest artists, along with Bonnie Bramlett, who by this time had become a solo artist on Capricorn. Reaching all the way back to his second coming days, Dickie brought in Reese Winans to play keyboards on the title track. But even with the help of Bramlett and Winans, sentimental connections to the Dwayne Allman days, the new Dickie Betts and Great Southern album failed to live up to the band's previous success. Nearly a decade would pass before either Dickie or Greg returned to the studio to record another solo album. Ironically, Sea Level was to become the first of the post-ABB offshoots to actually chalk up a hit album with a hit single. The band's second Capricorn LP, Cats on the Coast, featured an expanded lineup, along with the four musicians from the first record, there were saxophonist Randall Bramblett, one of the players on the Greg Allman tour, guitarist Davis Causey, and drummer-percussionist George Weaver. Released in December, Cats on the Coast was momentarily lost among the end-of-the-year superstar product. But by February 1978, both the album and its single, That's Your Secret, were on the charts. Granted, the single peaked at number 50, but the fact that it charted at all meant that it had surpassed the half-dozen singles released by Dickey and Greg during the previous year. By 1978, disco ruled the pop music world. On December 16, 1977, the movie Saturday Night Fever had been released, and it wasn't long before the Bee Gees and other artists featured on the film's soundtrack would dominate the charts along with Andy Gibbs, A Taste of Honey, Donna Summer, Chic, and other disco hitmakers. When the small plane carrying Leonard Skinner went down near Gillsburg, Mississippi, on October 20, 1977, Southern Rock seemed to have crashed along with it. There were still a few bands carrying on the tradition. 
Marshall Tucker and the outlaws among them. But for the time being, everybody just wanted to dance. Then, in the latter half of 1978, a series of events began to unfold that gave hope to fans of the Southern Sound. The Florida Times Union out of Jacksonville ran a story reporting that a reunion of the Allman Brothers Band was imminent. Despite the animosity among certain members of the band dating back to the trouble of two years earlier, Greg was quoted in the article as saying, Time heals a lot of things. Greg and Dickey had run into each other in January 1977 at the inauguration of Jimmy Carter, the former Georgia governor who had gotten strong support from the Southern Rock community during his bid for the presidency. Then, during the recording of Atlanta's Burning Down some ten months later, Greg and Phil Walden flew to Miami to begin discussions with Dickey about the possibility of reuniting the Allman Brothers. It would take almost a year, but on August 16, 1978, Greg, J-Mo, and Butch appeared on stage in Central Park with Dickie Betts and Great Southern. For the first time since May 4, 1976, the four surviving members of the original Allman Brothers Band played together, and the crowd was in a state of ecstasy. Then, on August 24th, Greg, Dickey, J-Mo, Butch, Chuck, and Lamar performed together at Capricorn's annual barbecue. It was becoming evident that time had, indeed, healed a lot of things, but not everything. Phil Walden announced that the band was now back together and getting ready to return to the studio but there were two major issues standing in the way of Chuck and Lamar's return. One was the growing success of sea level. The other was money. Lavelle and Williams both felt they had been shortchanged in the royalty department, and when it became evident that the issue wasn't going to be resolved anytime soon, they decided to stick with sea level especially since they were halfway through recording their third album. J-Mo, on the other hand, had already decided to bow out of his former side project band before work on Sea Level's third album had begun. By November 1978, there was a new lineup for the Allman Brothers Band. Greg, Dickey, J-Mo, Butch, Dangerous Dan Toller, and David Rook Goldflees, Toller and Goldflees having been recruited from Great Southern. In an effort to make this a genuine reunion in every sense of the word, the band returned to Criteria in Miami, the studio where they had recorded the last ABB tracks with Dwayne, and chose Tom Dowd to produce the new album. Years later, Butch Trucks would tell Dowd, the biggest mistake we ever made was thinking we could produce our own albums and not using you. It would be a mistake that they would make again on more than one occasion. But for now, Tom Dowd was the man in charge. Although Greg had been the one to suggest that the band reunite, this time around it was Dickey who took up the leadership role. He had, after all, given up his own band, something Chuck and Lamar weren't willing to do, he also arrived at the studio with a batch of new songs, including two co-written with his friend Don Johnson. The new album, which would be called Enlightened Rogues, had eight songs, with Greg's sole contribution being Just Ain't Easy. The near-obligatory blues cover this time around was the Little Willie John classic, Need Your Love So Bad. The rest of the album would belong to Dickey, including the single, Crazy Love. Dwayne Allman's presence can be felt throughout the album. From the very first track, Dickie's slide guitar is a reminder of one of Dwayne's greatest contributions to the band. And when the harmony guitar parts kick in during the seven-and-a-half-minute Betts composition, Pegasus, it is as if the band had found its way back to its glory days. With Pegasus, the ABB showed they were finally comfortable with the idea of returning to the original concept of two lead guitarists. 
Chuck's keyboard contributions had been formidable in the intervening years, but the time had come to allow the spirit of Dwayne Allman to shine through. And there's even a hint of the hourglass days on Need Your Love So Bad, where Dickie's bluesy lead guitar intro recalls the way Dwayne kicked off the B.B. King medley during the Hourglass's fame sessions in Muscle Shoals. The title also recalled the band's original leader. Dwayne had frequently referred to his band of brothers as enlightened rogues. There were more echoes in the promotional campaign. When the album was released in February 1979, full-page ads in various music magazines declared the legend endures and the light shines on. As Enlightened Rogues went gold and Crazy Love climbed into the top 40, it seemed for a time that the light would shine on as brightly as ever. But it was not to be. Problems were cropping up in abundance for both the band and its label. Lawsuits were flying everywhere. Dickie was suing Capricorn, Dale Betts was suing Dickie. Chuck Lavelle was suing the band. When Dickie won an arbitration hearing against Capricorn, the other members realized that they too were probably owed enormous amounts of back royalties. Amazingly, the band remained together even as everything fell apart around them. The disco craze continued to control the radio airwaves in 1979 and 1980. An interest in music by the Allman Brothers and other Southern bands dropped off precipitously. But Dickie still had a great relationship with Arista Records. So the ABB was signed to the label and began work on the first of two albums there, both of which would turn out to be artistic disasters. The Arista executives decided to push the band in a more contemporary direction on their next album. It was a move tantamount to trying to get Michelangelo to paint more like Picasso. Once again, Dickie handled most of the songwriting chores, with Greg contributing two songs he had co-written with Dangerous Dan. But the songs weren't the primary problem. The real issue was a failed attempt to merge the classic with the current. Mike Lawler of the band Lawler and Cobb played synthesizer on some numbers, as did Dickey. Along with his regular drum kit, Butch also brought a syndrome into the mix. It's impossible, of course, to know where Dwayne, had he lived, might have taken the band post-1971, but it's a good guess that this wouldn't have been the direction. The spirit of Dwayne Allman had been more than obvious on enlightened rogues. This time around, it was gone unless you counted the album's title, Reach for the Sky, which had been the title of the first album by Cowboy, the band Dwayne had gotten signed to Capricorn back in 1970. We went back and forth on the title, recalled Butch, and somebody said Reach for the Sky, so we called it that. We forgot that Cowboy had already done that. Tom Dowd's production skills are noticeably absent on the album, one of his many talents was the ability to capture an artist's natural sound, which he did with the Allman Brothers time and again throughout his career. This time, the band co-produced the album with Mike Lawler and Johnny Cobb. Much as had been the case with Greg's playing up a storm, there is a slickness to the sound that goes against the grain of what the band had always been about. In the years when Duane had led the group, there had been an ongoing maturation of the Allman Brothers' sound and style. It was easy to hear the natural progression. Even with brothers and sisters, the band had shown their ability to grow despite the loss of their leader. But with Reach for the Sky, they were compromising rather than evolving, and it simply didn't work. Even the advertising campaign was lousy. The magazine ad copy read, The band that opened the game now raises the stakes. In smaller type was the line, The Allman Brothers Band, making the music of their lives. A statement that couldn't possibly have been less true. 
The band's fan base was still strong enough to sell records, though. The album peaked at number 27, and its first single, Angeline, made it as far as number 58. But the second single, Mystery Woman, did nothing. And then, as if the release of the Allman Brothers' first truly mediocre album wasn't enough bad news, the band lost another of its founding members. There are several versions of the story, but in short, Jamo was fired. He discovered this when he arrived at a show to find David Frankie Toller's drums set up where his were supposed to be. Jamo's unceremonious canning was apparently brought on by his complaints about the band's enormous overhead. According to Jamo, he had asked for an audit to get to the bottom of all the unexplained miscellaneous expenses. At least one member of the band, Jamo's then wife Candace Oakley, says it was Dickey, bristled at the suggestion. In any case, with Jamo gone, the Allman Brothers Band now had as many players from Great Southern as it did original members. In March 1981, Greg, Dickey, Butch, Dan Toller, David Toller, David Goldflees, and Mike Lawler, with his synthesizer collection, went to Nashville, of all places, to record Brothers of the Road. Once again, Dickey contributed most of the songs, although this time all but one of his compositions had a co-writer. Greg brought three new tunes, but for the first time ever, there was no instrumental to show off the band's renowned improvisational skills. And finally, there was the death knell, a cover of Elvis Presley's I Beg of You. Despite all of the album's shortcomings, it did include a hit single, Straight from the Heart, written by Dickie Betts and Johnny Cobb, actually reached the top 40. Although overproduced, this time by John Ryan, who had also produced the Styx hit Lady, the song admittedly had a great hook. In fact, it could have been a hit for Styx or any other overblown arena rock act of the era. When the Allman Brothers Band appeared on the television show Solid Gold to promote their new album, it was one of the more surreal moments in the history of the medium. The show's host was Marilyn McCoo, formerly of the Fifth Dimension, who, along with her husband, Billy Davis Jr., had scored hits with songs like You Don't Have to Be a Star to Be in My Show. Throughout their long career, McCoo announced dramatically, our next guests have been through personnel changes and tragedies but have remained the leaders in Southern rock and roll. They've recorded six gold albums, and their latest, Brothers of the Road, is currently on its way to the top of the album charts. The rhetoric sounded good, but in truth, the album would peak some 43 spots below the top of the album charts. The camera then pulled back to show a miserable-looking Greg Allman standing next to her. Greg, I know the band broke up for three years, said McCoo. Now that you're back together again, is there any difference in your music? Greg, who couldn't have possibly looked more bored or sounded less excited, responded, Yes, we've added a lot of new blood, and we have new players, a synthesizer player, and there's a lot more singing, a lot of excitement. Good energy, huh? asked McCoo. Good energy, yeah, Greg answered lifelessly. A few weeks later, on January 23, 1982, the Allman Brothers made another TV appearance, this time on Saturday Night Live. They performed Midnight Rider, Southbound, and Leavin'. And leave they did. Once again, the Allman Brothers decided to go their separate ways. Sadly, former ABB and C-level bassist Lamar Williams passed away less than a year later at the age of 34. The cause of death was lung cancer, which his doctors believed might have been brought on by his exposure to Agent Orange while in Vietnam. Over the next several years, Greg and Dickey each formed bands and played gigs. Neither of them released any albums during that time, but the two bands began touring together in March 1986. 
Dickie's band would open, Greg's band would follow, and then the two bands would get together and play Allman Brothers songs. On a couple of occasions that year, the Allman Brothers band, despite all their past differences, actually regrouped in the form of Greg, Dickie, Butch, J. Mo, Chuck Lavelle, Dan Toller, and Bruce Wavell on bass. They played at Charlie Daniels' Volunteer Jam 12 and at the Crackdown on Crack concert at Madison Square Garden. During 1987 and 1988, Greg's recording career once again caught fire. The Greg Allman Band signed with Epic Records and scored a huge hit single with I'm No Angel. The album by that title and its follow-up, Just Before the Bullets Fly, both hit the charts. I'm No Angel even went gold, becoming Greg's best-selling record since Laid Back. In 1988, the Dickie Betts Band's Pattern Disruptive charted as well. The following year, Polygram Records released a four-CD box set entitled Dreams. The collection featured plenty of Allman Brothers tracks, but also included selections by the Allman Joys, The Hourglass, The 31st of February, and The Second Coming, along with Going Down Slow from Dwayne's aborted album project, solo recordings by Greg and Dickie, cuts by Dickie with Great Southern, and even Can You Fool by Greg and Cher. It was all the band needed to bring them back together again. With Greg and Dickie both on Epic Records, the Allman Brothers were also signed to the label. Over the next decade, the revitalized band would record a half dozen albums for Epic. Seven Turns, Shades of Two Worlds, An Evening with the Allman Brothers Band, Where It All Begins, Second Set, and Peeking at the Beacon. On all but the last one, guitarist Warren Haynes and bassist Alan Woody were part of the lineup. Tom Dowd was back, too. The band's first epic record was hailed by the critics as the Allman Brothers' comeback album, and the second CD proved that it wasn't a fluke. It also showed that the band was willing to expand both musically and in terms of additional personnel. After we did Seven Turns, said Tom Dowd, we next went to Memphis and did Shades of Two Worlds, which is where they picked up percussionist Mark Quinones. Butch had heard him at a Spyro Gyra concert and said, we got to get this kid, because we were talking about adding percussion to the album. They said, all right, we'll try him. Not only did they try him, they kept him. Following the success of the two studio albums, the Allman Brothers decided it was time to record live again to capture what Duane had always referred to as the band's natural fire. The initial plan was to make the album in Macon. It seemed like a good idea to everyone but the producer. That was bizarre, Dowd said. We talked about it, and I said, Are you guys sure you want to go back to Macon? I mean, it's like 20 years later. You're all family men, old girlfriends, and every other goddamn person is going to show up. They got back there, and it was nostalgia trip number one. They took turns getting drunk, getting high, or just being dumb. The second night, when we decided we were going to play good, clean fun, everybody is ready to play. Greg gets up there, and he's got a goddamn notice on his organ sitting there in like 10-inch letters saying, good, clean fun. And he says, now here's a song from our latest album. And he starts singing something off his latest album. Three of the guys are playing downbeats to good, clean fun. Everybody looks across at each other and goes, Oh, shit. It was deplorable. With nothing salvageable from the Macon shows, the band moved on to Boston and New York, using tracks from performances recorded in those two cities to create An Evening with the Allman Brothers Band, released in March 1992. 
The album was a collection of songs from every era of the band's career, including Dreams, Revival, Blue Sky, and the more recent End of the Line and Get On With Your Life. Before we started recording the next album, Dowd said, we had to find a studio. We wanted to get into Criteria, but it was booked for two months. Butch, who lives in South Florida, knew of Burt Reynolds' place, and he went by to check it out since he knew there was a sound stage for filming. He then called me to go take a look, so I drove up and inspected it, and it seemed like we could make something work there. We set up the amp line and the drums just like on stage, except we used half rigs, Betts told Kevin Ransom in a guitar player interview. Me and Warren each played one guitar, and we would change pickup settings or turn the volume up or down just like live, with the whole band playing at once. We rehearsed for three weeks and then cut the entire album in a week. Tom Dowd is such a genius at miking. He uses the bleed-over in a way that creates a sort of reverb. I don't know how the hell he does it. The album they cut, Where It All Begins, featured several songs the band still performs today, including Haynes' composition, Soul Shine. It also became the best-selling album of the Allman Brothers' epic years. Surprisingly, the band decided to follow that album with yet another live recording. Although the idea might have seemed like overkill at the time, the critics loved it, with one writer calling Second Set a high watermark in their Epic Records catalog. Insiders in the music business loved it too, singling out Jessica for a Grammy as 1995's Best Rock Instrumental Performance. It was their second notable honor of the year. On January 12th, the original six-member lineup of the Allman Brothers Band was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. With Willie Nelson, whose many hits include Midnight Rider, making the presentation. After second set, the band went five years without making another album. Some say they should have waited even longer. In the interim, between second set and Peekin at the Beacon, Warren Haynes and Alan Woody left to form the band Government Mule with drummer Matt Abs. They were replaced by guitarist Jack Pearson and bassist O'Teal Burbridge, whose playing recalled the melodic skills of Barry Oakley more than any of the band's other post-Oakley bass players. In mid-1999, Butch's nephew, Derek Trucks, a prodigy of the slide guitar, came on board to replace Jack Pearson. But the personnel changes didn't end there. After 31 years, Dickie Betts parted ways with the other original members of the band. The chemistry and the chemicals had changed. On October 29, 1996, the 25th anniversary of Dwayne's death, Greg had gone on the wagon. Four years later, a clean and sober Greg Allman didn't like what he was hearing. After the release of yet another live album, the muddy-sounding Pekin at the Beacon, Dickie Betts was fired. One of the stories regarding Dickie's dismissal recalled an unfortunate onstage incident, when upon kicking off a song, it was evident that something was going terribly wrong. Dickie is said to have turned to one of the other musicians and asked, What song are we playing? To which the other player responded, you mean me or you? In the fall of 2000, the film Almost Famous was released. Written and directed by Cameron Crowe, the movie was a thinly disguised fictional account of Crowe's days on the road with the Allman Brothers, covering the band for a piece in Rolling Stone. In the film, the band was called Stillwater, with Billy Crudup, looking practically identical to a young Dickie Betts, playing the part of the group's lead guitarist. The soundtrack album, which included the ABB's One Way Out, went on to win the Grammy as the best compilation album for a motion picture. For a while in 2000, Jimmy Herring replaced Dickie Betts in the ABB lineup. 
That August, the band's former bass player, Alan Woody, was found dead in a motel room in Queens. In March of the following year, Warren Haynes returned to the Allman Brothers, creating the lineup that has remained in place to 2008. Greg, Butch, J-Mo, Derek, Warren, O'Teal, and Mark. In 2003, the band released Hitting the Note on their own label, Peach, and some critics once again hailed it the Allman Brothers' great comeback album. At this point, the band seemed to be rivaling Muhammad Ali in the comeback department. In several interviews, Greg called Hitting the Note the band's best album since Eat a Peach, and he might very well have been right. With Tom Dowd's passing in 2002, the band had turned to Michael Barbiero to produce the record, and his work was practically an homage to Dowd. In September 2003, Bruce Wable, the bassist who had played on Greg's albums I'm No Angel and Just Before the Bullets Fly, as well as with the ABB for a short time, was found dead at his home in Florida. Incredibly, between 1972 and 2003, four of the band's six bassists had passed away. When the Allman Brothers had gotten back together in 1989, their New York venue of choice was the Beacon Theater, although they could have sold out much larger halls in Manhattan. The band loved the vibe in the old building at the corner of 74th and Broadway. Greg has said it reminds him of the old Fillmore East. From 1996 to 2007, the band has played a series of shows there every March, the yearly event now referred to by fans as March Madness. In March 2004, the Allman Brothers released a two-CD set of live recordings made at the Beacon the previous year. Entitled One Way Out, it was a vast improvement over Peacon at the Beacon. The review in the All Music Guide reads, Pair this with Hitting the Note, the studio album from 2003, and you have the sound of a band that has no peers. One Way Out is essential for anyone interested in rock and roll, period. The 18 tracks on One Way Out feature songs from the band's entire career, including Trouble No More, the very first song that Dwayne, Greg, and the rest of the original Allman Brothers band played together back in Jacksonville, Florida, all those years ago. Epilogue Still peeking at the beacon. One night at the beacon, I looked down and realized I was the only one left on the front line. Greg Ullman. It's a Friday night in New York City. In the tradition of more than 150 previous Allman Brothers band shows at the Beacon Theater, the joint is packed tighter than a subway car at rush hour. This is a ritual that shows absolutely no signs of losing its decade-and-a-half-long head of steam. Throughout the week, the band has been giving the crowd exactly what they've come for. Exemplary musicianship, a light show straight out of another era, an impressive array of guest musicians sitting in night after night, and classic songs from the Allman Brothers Band's 35-year career. In fact, on this night, March 26, 2004, the band and audience are celebrating exactly 35 years of Allman Brothers history. The first half of the show includes plenty of the old chestnuts, Statesboro Blues, Can't Lose What You Never Had, One Way Out, with guest guitarist Leroy Parnell sharing slide duties with Derek Trucks and Warren Haynes as well as Rock and Horse and the heart-wrenching Old Before My Time, both from Hitting the Note, the band's well-received album of the previous year. As if that weren't powerful enough, after the intermission, there is a seismic shift upward in the energy level as the band opens the second set with Mountain Jam. All of us behind the stage, grizzled road warriors, music industry veterans, various ABB family members, 
assorted friends and associates, are struck by the stepped-up intensity. The backstage chatter stops. We inch forward, ignoring the white stripe painted on the floor that both the fire marshal and tour manager Kirk West have already pointed out as the line not to be crossed under any circumstances, excluding presumably fire. The Mountain Jam drum solo has begun. The other band members drift off stage. Whether or not he's conscious of the anniversary date at this moment, JMO has figuratively caught fire. The years fall away as the trade offs between JMO and Butch seem to conjure the same magic they had at the Fillmore East more than three decades ago. The only difference is the addition of Mark Quinones on percussions, bringing congas, timbales, and cymbal crashes into the mix. After the drummers have done their thing, the rest of the band returns to the stage. But instead of resuming Mountain Jam, they segue into I Walk on Gilded Splinters. The song was originally written and recorded by Dr. John. But the version that comes to my mind tonight is Johnny Jenkins' 1970 rendition with Dwayne Allman on Dobro. Dwayne stays on my mind as Greg Allman begins to sing Ain't Wasting Time No More, the song he wrote immediately after his brother's death. The historic night ends with encores of the Otis Redding ballad I've Got Dreams to Remember and Southbound from Brothers and Sisters, the first Allman Brothers album without Dwayne. Watching the band walk past me as they head off stage and into the night, I wonder if the set list for the second half of the show was intended as a tribute to Dwayne Allman, or if it was simply a selection of great songs that worked well together in that sequence. I also think back to the show of Three Nights earlier and a rather unsettling moment that has stuck in my head. At the Tuesday Night Beacon show, the band's pre-encore closer was no one to run with. One of the standouts from their 1995 album, Where It All Begins. The lyrics tell the story of a man whose friends have all left town. As Greg sang, the screen above him was filled with images of musicians now gone. The New York crowd, many of whom probably weren't even born at the time of Dwayne Allman's death, had virtually no reaction as flickering images of Duane appeared on the giant backdrop. Footage of Barry Oakley was met with the same eerie silence. A few cheers could be heard when pictures of former ABB bassist Alan Woody came up, but when Jerry Garcia's face splashed across the screen, the crowd erupted in a loud roar. Garcia's voluminous contributions to American music and culture notwithstanding, observing the audience's reaction, or lack thereof, with respect to Duane and Barry, was nothing short of disconcerting to me. I couldn't help but wonder if Duane Allman has begun to fade from the public's collective memory, even from the memories of many fans of the very band that bears his name. A year earlier, the Allman brothers had added Layla to the set list, an overt tribute to Duane. Did the audiences who attended Allman brothers' concerts that year really grasp the connection? Or were they simply cheering the band's decision to cover an old Eric Clapton record? In September 2003, Rolling Stone published its list of the 100 greatest guitarists of all time placing Duane at number two, just behind Jimi Hendrix. I thought it was a very wonderful gesture, Greg told Hit in the Notes' John Linsky. And I thought, you made your mark, man. You didn't make any money, but you made your mark. Rounding out the top five on Rolling Stone's roster were B.B. King, Eric Clapton, and Robert Johnson. Pretty impressive company for a kid from the South who didn't even live to see his 25th birthday. March 2005 
It has now been almost exactly a year since I was last in New York to see the Allman Brothers at the Beacon. As had been the case in 2004, every seat at every show is filled. A tenth night has been added as a benefit concert for the Big House Foundation, a nonprofit organization created for the purpose of turning the Allman Brothers' old home in Macon into an ABB museum. For this special night, Chuck Lavelle is coming back to sit in with the band. During the past year, there have been indications that a southern rock resurgence is stirring. The Grammy Award show presented a tribute during its annual telecast, featuring a collection of modern-day country acts performing with Dickie Betts and the remnants of Leonard Skinner. CMT, the Country Music Television Network, has been running a documentary entitled American Revolutions, Southern Rock, several times a week. Both Chuck Lavelle and former Allman Brothers road manager Willie Perkins have published autobiographies. The Black Crows, second-generation Southern rockers, have gotten back together. Singular Wireless has run an ad campaign using Greg's Melissa as its theme music. KFC has done the same with Leonard Skinner's Sweet Home Alabama, and Dwayne's seven-note lick from Layla could be heard in commercials for SBC. It's difficult to imagine what Dwayne would have thought about the use of Layla to plug a telecommunications company, but it's certain that he would have been proud to know that along with Muddy Waters' Hoochie Coochie Man and John Coltrane's Giant Steps, the Library of Congress has chosen at Fillmore East as one of the selections added to its national recording registry this year. The genre, jump-started by Dwayne Allman, seems to have gained a whole new life, along with a whole new audience. The 2005 shows at The Beacon retain much of the old magic. Kirk West is still there telling those standing backstage to stay behind the white line. The light show continues to flicker on the giant screen behind the band. Special guests, including blues legend Little Milton, in what would turn out to be one of his last performances, sit in with the band. Even basketball star Bill Walton, famous not only for his days on the court, but also for attending more than 650 Grateful Dead concerts, is in the house. On Tuesday, March 15th, I spend some time with Percy Sledge, the singer who recorded When a Man Loves a Woman in Muscle Shoals back in 1966, is in Manhattan, having been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame the previous night. He talks to me about the days when J-Mo, whom he still refers to as Johnny, was playing drums for him. Percy can't remember exactly when j was in his rhythm section, so I tell him it has to have been at least 37 years ago since the Allman Brothers Band is on the verge of celebrating its 36th anniversary. Percy stares at me in amazement. Oh, my God, Randy, he whispers. Could it really have been that long ago? March 2006 Yet another year has come and gone. This beacon run, March 9th to March 26th, marks another anniversary. It has been 35 years since the recording of At Fillmore East. On March 13th, the Allman Brothers performed the entire album in sequence. There is Bedlam at the beacon. If the second coming is going to happen tonight... Jesus would be well advised to wait until the band has finished Whipping Post. As the concerts wind through the month of March, the guest musicians continue to flow in. Taj Mahal, Cornell Dupree, Jerry Jamont, Gary Rossington, Hubert Sumlin, Roy Haynes, and many others, all contributing their talents to the festivities. But it is on Sunday, March 26th, at the final show, when everything comes full circle. 
Finally, almost 35 years after Dwayne Allman passed on, the Allman brothers get the chance to play straight-ahead jazz. The song is Afro Blue, popularized by John Coltrane on his 1963 album, Live at Birdland. Sitting in with the band are John Coltrane's son, Ravi, on saxophone, and the man who played drums on Miles Davis's Kind of Blue, Jimmy Cobb. After the intermission, a gray-haired gentleman comes out on the stage, alone. With nothing but an acoustic guitar and a harmonica, he begins to play and sing an old blues song called My Mind is Ramblin'. Derek Trucks comes out to join the singer for his next number, Stone Pony Blues, and then the whole band returns to the stage to accompany him on Shake for Me. The blues man is John Hammond, Jr., the guy the Muscle Shoals Sound Rhythm Section wasn't sure about until Dwayne showed up to express his admiration. The man Greg has called Dwayne's best friend. The musician who stayed up all night with Dwayne in New York City, playing records and jamming on guitars just before Sky Dog made that final journey back to Macon. On more than one occasion, Butch Trucks, who grew up in the Southern Baptist Church, has referred to playing music in the band's early days as a religious experience. Not long before Tom Dowd passed away in 2002, Trucks and Dowd had a conversation in which the drummer explained why the band chose to continue playing after the passing of their leader. Dwayne had given us the religion, he said, and we were going to keep playing it. After wandering for years in the wilderness, with the formation of the Allman Brothers Band, Dwayne could deliver the musical message he had been carrying in his soul. He had spent a lifetime, short though it was, trying to create the sound he heard in his head and felt in his heart. It was his calling, and he had struggled at every turn to achieve his dream. The three complete Allman Brothers albums Dwayne played on were recorded at the end of one decade and the beginning of another. Dwayne and his band arrived at the perfect moment to play music for the generation Otis Redding had referred to as the love crowd. And just like Otis, Dwayne Allman passed away before the love crowd would be swallowed up by a world not nearly so loving. In his book, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, Hunter S. Thompson referred to living in that era as being akin to riding the crest of a high and beautiful wave, a wave that, in less than half a decade, had broken and receded. Dwayne Allman didn't live to see the power of the love crowd rapidly fading away. It would have been, no doubt, a painful experience for him. In my conversations with Rick Hall, the record producer frequently referred to Allman as being ahead of his time, although this was certainly the case as far as his early days in Muscle Shoals were concerned. From 1969 to 1971, Dwayne Allman was very much a man of his time. He rode right on the crest of the wave. On October 29th, 1971, Dwayne Allman's ride came to an end. But his music did not, and neither did the Brotherhood. The band's name was always more than a reference to Dwayne and Greg's relationship. It was truly a Brotherhood. But the Brotherhood didn't exist just among the members of the band and their roadies. It existed and continues to exist among the fans as well. It is also a community specific to neither age nor gender. Greg Allman has spoken of seeing audiences that included the children and grandchildren of folks who had attended Allman Brothers gigs two and three decades earlier. The Allman Brothers have more in common with the Grateful Dead than just Bill Walton. There is a bond among those who listen to the band's music. The spirit of community, even of family, goes on. 
Sky Dog's musical vision was the catalyst, but the spirit will remain long after the last note of that inevitable final concert fades away. And someday, many years from now, a young boy and his sister will stand on the pier at Daytona Beach listening to a slide guitarist as he plays an old, old song by the Allman Brothers Band. It will be a sound the young boy will never forget. Afterward, I was doing a cat a favor, that's all, but I'm sure glad I was around for it. Joel Dorn Those were the closing comments Joel Dorn made about his production of the track Please Call Home for the Allman Brothers' Idlewild South album in my March 2006 interview with him for the original hardcover edition of Sky Dog. They were the last words I would ever hear him say. On December 17, 2007, Joel Dorn died of a heart attack. He was 65 years old. Sadly, Joel Dorn has not been the only loss to the Brotherhood. In the course of only three months during the last quarter of 2007, four other important figures in the ABB camp passed away. Mike Callahan, Barry Oakley's old friend who drove the bus for the Romans and later became the Allman Brothers Band's first sound man, died on September 26th at the age of 62. Steve Masarski, who became the manager for Dickie Betts in Great Southern in 1976 and took over management of the Allman Brothers Band two years later, succumbed to cancer at the age of 59 on October 5th. On October 14th, John Meeks, drummer for The Second Coming, was killed in a house fire. The following month, John Scooter Herring, whose federal drug case in June of 1976 led to the first breakup of the band, passed away on November 10th. Indeed, much has happened in the world of the Allman Brothers Band since the initial release of Sky Dog in the fall of 2006. But not all of the news is tragic. In May of 2006, Derek Trucks joined Eric Clapton's touring band. Clapton and Trucks kept the spirit of Dwayne Allman alive as the band traveled around the world, playing a set list that included Layla, featuring Derek on slide guitar. Not wanting Trucks to miss out on the opportunity to tour with Dwayne's old friend, the ABB worked their schedule around Clapton's gigs throughout the rest of the year. Reminiscent of Dwayne's hectic schedule back in the days when the guitarist would play on sessions in New York, Muscle Shoals, Macon, or Miami between gigs with the Allman Brothers Band, Derek had very few days off once Clapton's tour got underway. In one three-week stretch, Trucks played a show with Clapton in London on June 10th flew to the U.S. to play a dozen gigs with the ABB between June 16th and July 2nd, and then returned to Europe to meet back up with Clapton on July 7th for a show in Italy. Trucks left the Clapton tour in early 2007 to regroup with the Allman Brothers Band for their annual Beacon shows that March. On December 19th, 2007, the Big House Foundation announced its purchase of the house at 2321 Vineville Avenue in Macon, following through with its plan to turn the former home of the band into a museum filled with ABB memorabilia. On February 24, 2008, the Macon Film Festival hosted a sold-out showing of Please Call Home, the Big House documentary. The film includes in-depth interviews with Greg, Butch, j -Mo, Linda Oakley, Chuck Lavelle, Red Dog Campbell, Kim Payne, Tuffy Phillips, Alan Walden, and others who were part of the making scene during the band's years there. The documentary captures a very special moment in time, showing that the Allman Brothers Band was much more than just a group of excellent musicians who happened to spend a brief period of time under the same roof. In other motion picture-related developments, 
The long-rumored filming of the second Atlanta International Pop Festival has turned out not to be a rumor at all. A documentary consisting of performances by a number of bands at the festival, including the Allman Brothers, is being produced, finally giving Dwayne's fans the opportunity to see him perform on film in an extended live setting. Taking place less than a year after the original Woodstock Festival, the communal spirit of the era was clearly still going strong in Atlanta during those three days in July of 1970. Dwayne Allman's dream of perpetuating that communal spirit would eventually become a global reality, due in great part to the advent of the Internet. Today, thanks to the band's official website, almondbrothersband.com, thousands of ABB enthusiasts from all over the world have the opportunity to stay in contact with each other through the site's forums and chat rooms. Many fans who have previously only met through the website have gotten the opportunity to meet in person when they've gathered at the Beacon and other venues to see the band perform. When I finished writing the first edition of Sky Dog in mid-2006, the website youtube.com was still in its infancy. All of my research pertaining to Dwayne Allman on film and video had been done by purchasing or borrowing bootlegged, multi-generational VHS tapes and DVDs, usually showing very grainy footage of Dwayne and the band in action. Now, all one has to do is go to youtube.com to find a host of great archival moments of the ABB during Dwayne's time with the band. Another website, wolfgangsvault.com, features the audio portion of entire sets of Dwayne with the brothers. As is the case with many books written during the Internet age, the website skydogbook.com was created when the original hardback was published. Included on the site is an email link that has resulted in my receiving hundreds of messages from Dwayne Allman fans worldwide. Many people wrote to tell me that the book had caused them to dig through their old vinyl and CDs in search of recordings featuring Dwayne. Some shared with me their experiences of having seen the Allman Brothers band live at the Fillmore East, the Fillmore West, the Warehouse, the Roxy, the Cosmic Carnival, Love Valley, Ludlow Garage, and dozens of other places where Dwayne and the band performed. Some wrote to tell me of seeing the guitarist when he appeared with Derek and the Dominoes in Tampa, Florida. Others told me of seeing Dwayne with D&D &D in Syracuse, New York. A few folks even wrote to tell me about errors I had made in the original text. In those cases where I was able to verify inaccuracies, corrections have been made for this edition. But to me, the most fascinating result of the email link has been my receipt of numerous messages from people who actually knew Duane, jammed with Duane, or even played in early bands with Duane back in Daytona Beach. Shortly after the hardcover edition of Sky Dog was released, I was asked to do a reading and book signing at Book Soup, an ultra-hip bookstore on Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles. Those in attendance included Billy Gibbons, ZZ Top member and this book's forward writer, Mike Johnstone and Johnny Townsend. It was a magic moment to have three of Dwayne's old friends together in the same room for the first time. The next day, I began a book signing tour of the Southeast, with stops in Muscle Shoals, Jacksonville, Atlanta, and other cities where I met many more of Allman's old friends who were happy to share their Dwayne stories with me. The highlight of the trip was a book signing party at the Big House, graciously organized by Kirk and Kirsten West. That night, Kirk put me up in what had been Dwayne's bedroom. As I sat on the bed, checking emails on my laptop, I saw a message from a familiar name, Deering Howe. Dwayne had been at his friend Deering's place on his last night in New York City, 
before that final trip back to Macon in late October of 1971. In his email, Deering Howe wrote, You captured Duane, his love of life, his love of music, and his love of people. He was one hell of a man and one hell of a musician. I miss him a lot. Thanks for portraying him as he truly was, warts and all. For many years, one of the catchphrases for the Allman Brothers Band's annual series of shows at the Beacon Theater has been March Madness. In 2008, the concert dates were moved from March to May. Without missing a beat, the band's website splashed the news under the headline, Mayhem in Manhattan. But it was not to be. Rumors about Greg Allman's health had already been swirling around for months when the band released a statement on March 27th, announcing that the Beacon shows had been postponed indefinitely due to Greg's ongoing treatment for hepatitis C. In the press release, Greg stated, I'm getting better, but I'm still tired. I need to be at 110% to do the shows the way we do them. I can't tell you how much I appreciate the support and understanding my brothers and our fans have given me. A few weeks later, there was another press release, this one announcing that the Beacon shows had been canceled. New York's a second home to us, said Greg. We love playing there and are as disappointed as anybody not to be able to get there this time. March 15th, 2008. It's the annual SXSW Music Conference and Festival in Austin, Texas. Former Derek and the Dominoes member Bobby Whitlock, along with his wife, Coco Carmel, take the stage at the Cedar Door, supported by a stellar lineup that includes guitarist Stephen Bruton and David Grissom. The show consists primarily of songs from Bobby and Coco's album, Lovers, which was released a few weeks earlier. Near the end of the set, though, Whitlock begins to reminisce about his days with Derek and the Dominoes and the recording of the classic song for which the group would always be best remembered. Most people don't realize it was Dwayne Allman who brought us those seven notes, says Whitlock, the seven greatest notes in the history of rock. And then Bobby, Coco, and the band break into an absolutely riveting version of Layla. When the last note ends, some seven minutes later, the applause seems to go on almost as long as the song itself. As the concert comes to a close and the crowd begins to file out, I think back to the final words of Jerry Wexler's eulogy for Duane. We have his music, and the music is imperishable. The road goes on. Farther on up the road. Many of Dwayne Allman's friends and associates would go on to have successful careers in the music business. Here's a quick summary of what happened to some of them in the years after Dwayne's death, along with a sampling of their memories of Dwayne. Johnny Townsend. As a member of Dirty John and the Nightcaps, Townsend was greatly impressed with the professionalism and musicianship of the Almond Joys. He would eventually join forces with Ed Sanford to become the Sanford Townsend Band and record the 1977 top 10 hit, Smoke from a Distant Fire, produced by Jerry Wexler and Barry Beckett at Muscle Shoals Sound Studios. Duane had the patience of Job, says Townsend. I once saw him coaching Tippy Armstrong, Tippy was always cautious about not wanting to steal any of Dwayne's licks, but Dwayne took him aside and showed him some methods and modes and things he could play around in to come up with his own stuff. Dwayne Allman improved the quality of life for a lot of people around him. Paul Hornsby Hornsby's many Southern rock production credits include albums by the Marshall Tucker Band, and the Charlie Daniels Band. He produced Tucker's hits, Can't You See, Fire on the Mountain, and Heard It in a Love Song, 
and Daniel's long-haired country boy, and the South's going to do it again. In 2005, Hornsby and several of his old friends got together to reform the Capricorn Rhythm Section. Playing gigs that frequently include special guests such as Bonnie Bramlett and Leroy Parnell, the band is made up of Hornsby on keyboards, Johnny Sandlin on bass, Scott Boyer and Tommy Talton on guitars and vocals, and Bill Stewart on drums. During the hourglass days, Dwayne was visually the focus of the band, says Hornsby. He was the commanding personality. When there's somebody like that in a group, you realize, well, hey, we got to do what this guy says because he's the stuff, you know. He's the first person I ever saw that looked that way, acted that way, talked that way, played that way. He was really an American original. Johnny Sandlin Another former member of the Hourglass, Sandlin would produce not only Ramblin' Man and other works by the Allman Brothers, as well as solo projects by Greg and Dickey, but also a host of other acts, including Cowboy, Wet Willie, Elvin Bishop, Bonnie Bramlett, The Outlaws, The Dixie Dregs, and Widespread Panic. Duane was one of the most interesting, exciting, and alive people that I ever knew, Sandlin said in a Grits Magazine interview. He was one of the most intelligent as well. Most of the time, he was great to be around, and he was so dedicated to music. Whenever anyone played with Duane, he would bring out the best in them. He was an inspiration. He was one of the best that ever was. John McEwen. McEwen and his fellow Nitty Gritty Dirt Band members were at the onset of a critically acclaimed and commercially successful career when they met Duane and Greg in 1967. In early 1971, the NGDB scored a top 10 hit with Mr. Bojangles. The following year, the band single handedly ushered in the Americana music scene with the release of their platinum-selling, Grammy-nominated three-record set, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? In May 2006, the Dirt Band celebrated its 40th anniversary, one of the few bands that have been around even longer than the Allman Brothers. Being a band leader, being somebody that other people rally around and get behind, is not an easy thing, says McEwen. Most often, somebody has to be a strong person to have people believe in them. With Dwayne, you're talking about a great band leader. Reese Winans After his days with Boz Skaggs, former Second Coming member Winans went on to play keyboards with Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble until Vaughan's tragic death in a helicopter crash on August 27, 1990. Winans continues to be one of the most sought-after keyboard players around, having recorded with Carol King, Joe Eli, Leroy Parnell, Kenny Wayne Shepherd, Buddy Guy, Brooks and Dunn, Montgomery Gentry, Johnny Winter, and Los Lonely Boys. Dwayne entered a room and you just wanted to go over there and say hello to him, Reese recalls. He had a lot of enthusiasm and charisma and you could just hear the passion in Duane's playing. His playing would soar. It would take me to places that I had never been. David Brown After his time with the 31st of February, Brown went to San Francisco with Reese Winans to play bass in Boz Skaggs' band. He remained with Skaggs for several years, appearing on the album's Moments, Boz Skaggs and Band, and my time. He also played on Greg's Laid Back LP, as well as recordings by Bonnie Bramlett and Elvin Bishop. Scott Boyer In addition to his work with Tommy Talton in Cowboy, Boyer also played on albums by Greg, Dickey, Wet Willie, Bonnie Bramlett, Sailcat, and others. 
his composition, Please Be With Me, on which Duane played Dobro for the original Cowboy recording, was covered by Eric Clapton on his classic 1974 Tom Dowd-produced album, 461 Ocean Boulevard. Duane was a very humble guy in that he looked to find something good in every musician he played with, says Boyer. He wanted to add to what you did. In a musical situation, he never put himself above anybody else. Johnny Weicker Still a mainstay of the southern music scene today, Weicker formed Sailcat in the early 1970s and had a hit with Motorcycle Mama in 1972. He continues to promote the catalog of the late Eddie Hinton, the studio guitarist, songwriter, recording artist, and record producer who was the inspiration for Duane's move to Muscle Shoals in 1968. Weicker is also the mastermind behind the Alabama-based Mighty Field of Vision, Web Radio, and Foundation. The radio format focuses on primarily Southern independent music, while the foundation was created to provide emergency charitable assistance to indigent and disabled musicians. Pete Carr Former Hourglass bassist Carr, who produced the Motorcycle Mama album for Sailcat, went on to become one of the greatest studio guitarists of his time. His playing can be heard on Bob Seger's Main Street and Fire Lake, Paul Simon's Kodachrome, and St. Judy's Comet, Luther Ingram's If Loving You Is Wrong, I Don't Want to Be Right, Barbara Streisand's Woman in Love, and the biggest hit of Rod Stewart's career, Tonight's the Night. He has also played on recordings by Bobby Womack, Percy Sledge, Willie Nelson, Hank Williams Jr., Cat Stevens, Wilson Pickett, and Joe Cocker. In 1977, Carr joined forces with singer Lenny LeBlanc. As LeBlanc and Carr, they had a top 15 hit that same year with Fallen. LeBlanc and Carr were on tour with Leonard Skinnerd when Skinnerd's plane crashed on October 20, 1977, killing band members Ronnie Van Zandt Steve Gaines, and Steve's sister, background vocalist Cassie Gaines. Fortunately, Carr and his partner were not on the plane. Alan Walden After a parting of the ways with his brother Phil in 1970, Alan continued to work in the R&B and rock worlds, eventually managing Leonard Skinner and the Outlaws. In 2003, he was inducted into the Georgia Music Hall of Fame. Dwayne was the undisputed leader of the Allman Brothers, he says. Greg and everybody had to take note when Dwayne spoke his mind. In Leonard Skinner, Ronnie Van Zandt was the undisputed leader. His word was law. In the Allman Brothers, Dwayne was the one everybody had to look up to. Phil Walden Phil Walden was inducted into the Georgia Music Hall of Fame in 1986. As if managing Otis Redding and founding Capricorn Records weren't enough, he also helped to finance Jimmy Carter's successful bid for the presidency in 1976 through a series of fundraising concerts performed by Capricorn artists. Walden's monumental successes and equally monumental failures are far too many to enumerate here. He lived life on a grand scale and is worthy of his own book-length biography. Phil Walden passed away on April 23, 2006, at the age of 66. He, too, is buried at Rose Hill Cemetery in Macon. He once observed, If I had to say who I thought was the most important contemporary figure in rock music, as far as the launching of what became known as Southern rock music is concerned, it would be Dwayne Allman. Chuck Lavelle After his days with the Allman Brothers and Sea Level, Lavelle went on to become one of rock's best-known keyboard men. 
The artists he has recorded with include the fabulous Thunderbirds, the Black Crows, Blues Traveler, Linda Ronstadt, Richard Ashcroft, Leanne Womack, Government Mule, and Widespread Panic. He has toured with George Harrison and Eric Clapton and has recorded three albums with Clapton, including the guitarist multi-million selling Unplugged. As if all of that weren't impressive enough, since 1982, Lavelle has handled keyboard duties for the Rolling Stones. He has played on all of their albums from undercover to the present, as well as having toured with the band for more than 25 years, serving as both keyboardist and musical director. And a final word from Greg Allman. My brother was a real pistol, the younger Allman brother once said. He was a hell of a musician, but he was a hell of a person, too. People forget that sometimes. He taught me to stick to my guns, stand up for what you believe in, and don't let anyone tell you what to play. That's how Dwayne put it to me, and I've never forgotten it. That's how he lived, so it wasn't a hard lesson to learn. Dwayne Allman, A Discography Unlike the cases of Jimi Hendrix, Bob Marley, Jerry Garcia, and Tupac Shakur, there has not been a wave of previously unreleased Dwayne Allman recordings flooding the marketplace in the years since his death although there are a number of bootlegs circulating with Allman Brothers live performances and unreleased studio sides from the Duane era, as well as several of the tracks from Allman's aborted solo album. The discography does not include bootlegs, samplers, imports, flexi-discs, singles on which both sides appear on an album already listed, soundtrack albums featuring recordings that previously appeared on other releases, or many of the seemingly endless greatest hits collections by the Allman Brothers Band and other artists on whose recordings Duane played. In the case of certain recordings Allman is alleged to have played on, but for which he is credited neither on session sheets, the albums themselves, nor by any other currently verifiable means, such tracks have not been included. One record producer has said the guitarist had a habit of unexpectedly showing up and sitting in on sessions, playing on a number of recordings for which he has received no credit to the present day, thus making a complete discography of Dwayne Allman virtually impossible. The extremely observant will notice that the two King Curtis tracks from Atco's Soul Christmas LP do not appear in this discography. Despite the fact that Dwayne was credited as the guitarist on the Christmas song and What Are You Doing on New Year's Eve on Rhino Records' reissue of Soul Christmas, it would seem to be a chronological impossibility. Aside from the fact that the guitarist doesn't sound like Allman, but does sound an awful lot like Eric Gale, the two songs in question were cut in New York at Atlantic Recording Studios several weeks prior to Duane becoming a sideman on Atlantic Sessions. In addition, both of the Curtis sides were produced by Tom Dowd, who said in a number of interviews that he didn't know about Duane until he heard Allman's guitar work on Wilson Pickett's version of Hey Jude, which wasn't recorded until the King Curtis Christmas tracks had already been released. Many of the recordings listed here first came out on vinyl, have since gone in and out of print on both vinyl and CD, and have returned on CD again with bonus tracks, remixed, remastered, resequenced, etc. Therefore, I have chosen to reference the original domestic album or single made by the artist listed, as well as the original label. With regard to recordings made by the Allman Brothers Band, for obvious reasons, I have listed only those albums from the years during which Dwayne was a member. I have also listed the ABB albums in the order they were released, as opposed to the chronological order in which they were recorded, which is why, for example, 
the April 1970 recording of Live at Ludlow Garage, appears prior to Fillmore East, February 1970. For an extremely detailed account of the Allman Brothers recordings through the year 2000, check out Dean Reynolds' beautifully illustrated The Complete Allman Brothers Band Discography. I am extremely grateful to Stuart Krause, Dwayne Allman discographer extraordinaire, who made me aware of some of the recordings D.A. played on that weren't a part of this discography in the first edition of Sky Dog. Recordings by bands featuring Dwayne Allman. Allman Joys. Spoonful, backed with You Deserve Each Other. Dial, 1966. Dwayne Allman's first commercially released record, the A-side featuring an up-tempo, fuzz-heavy version of Willie Dixon's Spoonful. Produced by legendary Nashville songwriter John D. Loudermilk at Bradley's Barn Recording Studio in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. Early Allman, featuring Dwayne and Greg Allman. Dial, 1973. These 12 tracks, including the A-side of the Allman Joy's first single, as well as seven songs written or co-written by Greg. According to Dwayne, after Dial owner Buddy Killen heard these tapes in 1966, he advised the band to go look for a day gig. Hourglass Hourglass Liberty, 1967 the debut album by the group Dwayne later called A Good Damn Band of Misled Cats. Power of Love, Liberty, 1968. The band's much improved second and last album, including the excellent Down in Texas, written by Muscle Shoals based songwriters Eddie Hinton and Marlon Green. The title song, by fellow Shoals songwriters Dan Penn and Spooner Oldham, is another highlight. 31st of February Dwayne and Greg Allman Bold, 1972 Although the 31st of February released its debut album on Vanguard, that LP predated Dwayne and Greg's involvement with the band. The songs on Dwayne and Greg Allman were recorded in 1968 by the 31st of February's five-member lineup, Dwayne, Greg, Butch Trucks, Scott Boyer, and David Brown. As was the case with the Allman Joys album, these recordings were not released until after Dwayne Allman's death. Dwayne's slide playing is captured on tape for the first time here, on Greg's song, Melissa. The Allman Brothers Band The Allman Brothers Band At Coastland Capricorn Records Series, 1969 The band's debut album, recorded in New York in only six days, featuring three of Greg Allman's finest compositions. It's Not My Cross to Bear, Dreams, and Whipping Post. Idlewild South at Coast Land Capricorn Records Series, 1970. Dickie Betts' first songwriting contributions to the band are here. The classic instrumental in memory of Elizabeth Reed and the album single, Revival. The latter song would tap the bottom of the Top 100 Singles chart for three weeks. It was as close as the band would get to a hit single during Dwayne's lifetime. Incredibly, the 45 of Midnight Rider, which would later be a solo hit for Greg and other artists, failed to make it onto the charts at all. At Fillmore East, Capricorn, 1971, The Masterpiece. Considered by many to be the greatest live recording ever, play all night. This double album is the ultimate testament to Dwayne Allman's talent as a guitarist, band leader, and musical visionary. From Statesboro Blues, the first cut on side one, to
to whipping post, which takes up all of side four, the band is nothing short of flawless, absolutely essential. Eat a Peach, Capricorn, 1972. Unfinished at the time of Duane's death, this second double album includes Duane's acoustic instrumental, Little Martha, Dickie's beautiful Blue Sky, Greg's Melissa, and a 33-minute version of Mountain Jam, one of the album's three tracks culled from the remaining Fillmore East recordings of March and June 1971. Dreams Polygram, 1989 The box set that brought the band back together. Over the course of four CDs, Dreams chronicles not only the ABB's well-known works, but previously unreleased recordings by the Almond Joys, the Hourglass, and the Almond Brothers, as well as Dwayne's heartfelt tribute to King Curtis. You Don't Love Me, backed with Soul Serenade, and the first non-bootleg release of Little Martha that includes Oakley's bass guitar, which was mixed out of the Eat a Peach version. Live at Ludlow Garage, 1970. Polydor, 1990. Proof positive that the band was already a hot live act by April 1970. This two-CD set includes a rare I'm Gonna Move to the Outskirts of Town and an even more mountainous take of Mountain Jam than the one on Eat a Peach, this version clocking in at 44 minutes. Of particular interest is Duane's lead vocal on Dimples. The Fillmore Concerts Polydor, 1992 An interesting two-CD parallel universe version of At Fillmore East and the live tracks from Eat a Peach, including some alternate takes, all transferred to digital format and remixed, and in some cases, re-edited by splicing together two different versions of the same song by Tom Dowd. Fillmore East, February 1970. Grateful Dead Records, 1997. These recordings were made by the Grateful Dead's Owsley Stanley during the run of Fillmore shows in which the Allman Brothers opened for the Dead. Long out of print, this one's now a highly sought-after collectible. American University, 121370. Allman Brothers Band Recording Company, 2002. Taken from two sets performed at Leonard Jim on the American University campus in Washington, D.C., this CD was released as the first in a series of historic live recordings on the band's own label. SUNY at Stony Brook, 9-1971, Allman Brothers Band Recording Company, 2003. Second in the series of historic live recordings, this two-CD set was recorded on quarter-inch tape at seven and a half inches per second, and it sounds like it. Despite the bootleggish sonic quality, the spirit is there. The second disc includes nearly 20-minute versions of Dreams and In Memory of Elizabeth Reed. It is also notable because it marks one of Duane's last performances with the band. Live at the Atlanta International Pop Festival, July 3rd and 5th, 1970. Epic Legacy, 2003. The Allman Brothers opened and closed this three-day Woodstock South. Five of the same songs appear in both the July 3rd and July 5th shows, but there's still plenty of variety. Tom Doucette's harmonica abounds throughout much of the proceedings, and Johnny Winter steps in to play along on the July 5th performance of Mountain Jam. At Fillmore East, Deluxe Edition, Mercury, 2003. One more time, but this collection consists of the entire original album, the live tracks from Eat a Peach, 
the Fillmore East recordings that first appeared on the two Dwayne Allman anthologies and the Fillmore East recording of Drunken Hearted Boy that first appeared in the Dreams box set. Eat a Peach, Deluxe Edition, Mercury, 2006. Another two-CD set with the original Eat a Peach album on disc one. Disc two is the revelation of this collection, consisting of the final Fillmore East concert from June 27, 1971. One Way Out is included on the second disc, even though it also appears on disc one, as well as Midnight Rider, which made its debut on An Anthology Volume 2. The remaining tracks that make up Disc 2 are all previously unreleased, providing fans with seven new recordings of the ABB in its prime. Boston Common, 8-1771. Allman Brothers Band Recording Company, 2007. The third in a series of live recordings of the ABB during Dwayne's tenure with the band, this CD captures the first of two shows performed that day. It's the usual set list from the era, Statesboro Blues, Trouble No More, Whipping Post, etc. The highlight being a scorching 26-minute take on You Don't Love Me. Dwayne Allman's session work in alphabetical order. The Blues. Milk and Honey, back with Leaving Lisa. Amy Single, 1968. Juliana's Gone, back with Mystery Smoke. Bell Single, 1969. 245s recorded by this blue-eyed soul band from Gadsden, Alabama with Dwayne playing guitar on Milk and Honey and Juliana's Gone, and bringing out his slide for Leaving Lisa. Ella Brown, A Woman Left Lonely, Backed with Touch Me, Lanner Single, 1971. Recorded at Capricorn Studios in Macon, Dwayne Allman played on both sides of this soulful 45. Ella Brown, wife of Jackie Avery, the man responsible for bringing Dwayne and J-Mo together, went on to become a member of the Williettes, Wet Willie's all-female group of background singers. James Carr, These Ain't Raindrops, back with To Love Somebody, Gold Wax Single, 1969. The vast majority of recordings by this greatly underrated soul singer were cut in Memphis, including the A-side of this 45. To Love Somebody was recorded at Fame Studios and Muscle Shoals with Allman and Jimmy Johnson sharing guitar duties. Clarence Carter, the dynamic Clarence Carter, Atlantic, 1969. This album consists of some of Duane's earliest recordings as a sideman in Muscle Shoals including his spectacular slide playing on The Road of Love. Coleman Hinton Project, Lost and Found, Breathe Easy Music, 1995. Recorded from 1969 through 1971, this collection was cut in Muscle Shoals by Jim Coleman and studio guitarist Eddie Hinton. Hinton wanted Duane to play on the whole album, but Coleman preferred Tippy Armstrong, who would later become a lead guitarist for Muscle Shoals Sound's rhythm section. Duane ended up playing on one song, What Goes On, which also featured a soprano sax solo by King Curtis. Arthur Conley, More Sweet Soul, Atco, 1969. Following in the footsteps of Wilson Pickett, Conley, of Sweet Soul Music fame, covers the Beatles. This time, it's Obla oh Dee, Obla oh Da, a charting single, although not nearly as successful as Pickett's recording of Hey Jude. Dwayne has a field day here on Stuff You Gotta Watch. Cowboy. Five will get you ten. 
Capricorn, 1971. Among the best of the Capricorn artists, Cowboy was also among the least successful sales-wise. Duane plays Dobro on Scott Boyer's ballad, Please Be With Me, later covered by Eric Clapton. Delaney and Bonnie and Friends To Bonnie from Delaney, Atco, 1970 Duane's Dobro is featured on the medley of Come On In My Kitchen, Mama, He Treats Your Daughter Mean, Going Down the Road Feeling Bad. Allman plays guitar on several tracks, including the hit single, Soul Shake, but he truly shines on the up-tempo rocker Living on the Open Road. Motel Shot, Atco, 1971. Duane is back to play Dobro on a full-length version of Come On In My Kitchen on this primarily acoustic affair. Bonnie Bramlett recalls Allman handling the rhythm parts for some songs by beating on a briefcase. Duane plays slide on the album's best number, Sing My Way Home. D&B Together, Columbia, 1972. Released after Duane's death, his guitar work appears on A Good Thing I'm On Fire. Derek and the Dominoes, Layla and Other Assorted Love Songs, Atco, 1970. If Dwayne Allman had played on no other album but this one, he would still deserve legend status. Appearing on 11 of the 14 cuts, Allman matches musical wits with Eric Clapton on one of the finest rock albums ever made. His slide work over the piano track at the end of Layla helped to create an FM radio staple that continues to receive steady airplay to the present day. And his bird calls that conclude the song would be emulated by Leonard Skinner on Freebird, their anthem dedicated to the guitarist. The Layla Sessions, 20th Anniversary Edition, Polydor, 1990. A three-CD celebration of the original album with alternate takes, Duane's duet with Eric on Mean Old World and five different jams, including one with both Allman Brothers, Clapton, Bobby Whitlock, Dickie Betts, Barry Oakley, and Butch Trucks. The Duck and the Bear Going Up to Country, backed with Hand Jive Atlantic Single, 1969 a one-off single featuring Dwayne on slide and Eddie Hinton on lead. Screwed up title and all, this is the two guitarists' instrumental spin on canned heats going up the country. Doris Duke, I'm a Loser, Canyon, 1969. A year after the demise of the Hourglass, Dwayne and Pete Carr got back together to play guitars on one of the best Southern soul albums of the era. According to Swamp Dog, the album's producer, Dwayne came in the studio one morning immediately after arriving from a tour and said he wanted to sit in. As a result, he played on several of the tracks in conjunction with Pete. Eric Quincy Tate Eric Quincy Tate Rhino Handmade 2006. As with Leonard Skinner and the Marshall Tucker Band, no one in the group was actually named Eric Quincy Tate. EQT's debut was released on the Cotillion label in 1971. When Rhino Handmade reissued the band's first album on CD in 2006, seven bonus tracks were added, including a demo of Coming Down featuring slide work by Dwayne. Aretha Franklin, This Girl's in Love with You, Atlantic, 1970. This album scored five hit singles, including The Weight, with the funkiest slide playing of Dwayne's career. This Girl's in Love with You also includes some of the earliest work of Allman and King Curtis together on both The Weight and Ronnie Miller's It Ain't Fair. Spirit in the Dark, Atlantic, 
1970. Dwayne can barely be heard playing acoustic guitar on Pullin', but the one other track he's on, When the Battle is Over, is a virtual guitar fest featuring Allman, Eddie Hinton, and Jimmy Johnson. Barry Goldberg and Two Jews Blues, Buddha, 1969. A solo album from the former Electric Flag member featuring Dwayne's guitar work on Twice a Man. John Hammond, Southern Fried, Atlantic, 1970. Hammond was having a difficult time trying to get the Muscle Shoals sound rhythm section into his blues groove until Allman showed up out of nowhere to save the day. Dwayne plays on Shake For Me, I'm Leaving You, Crying For My Baby, and You'll Be Mine. Ronnie Hawkins. Ronnie Hawkins, Cotillion, 1970. Features Dwayne on the single Down in the Alley, as well as 40 Days, Who Do You Love, and Matchbox. The last song, including Hawkins' exclamation, Go Sky Dog. The Hawk, Cotillion, 1971. Allman plays on almost every track and even does a bit of vocalizing on Drinking Wine, Spodiote. Johnny Jenkins, Tonton Makut, Atco Capricorn Record Series, 1970. Produced by Johnny Sandlin, this album has a stellar cast of musicians, including Allman Brothers band members Dwayne, Barry, Butch, and j as well as former Hourglass members Paul Hornsby, Pete Carr, and Sandlin. Down Along the Cove, a track from Dwayne's aborted fame solo album, gets a second life here with Jenkins' vocal replacing Allman's. King Curtis Instant Groove, Atco, 1969. Allman performs on four songs, including the Grammy-winning Games People Play. It's evident his stature as a sideman was growing by this time, as there is a separate credit for him on the back cover. None of the other musicians, except Curtis himself, are listed. Laura Lee, Love More Than Pride, Chess, 1972. Laura Lee and her label mate, Etta James, made some of their finest records under the tutelage of producer Rick Hall at Fame Studios. Dwayne, Rick's go-to guy, played on the Laura Lee tracks, It Ain't What You Do, But How You Do It, and It's How You Make It Good. The Lovells. I'm Coming Today, Back with Pretending Deer, Atco Single, 1969. Dwayne played on both sides of this single, produced by Dave Crawford and Roy Lee Johnson. With a slight lineup change, the Lovells would go on to have a series of R&B hits under the name Faith, Hope, and Charity. Lulu, New Routes, Atco, 1969. Recorded by the To Sir With Love singer in Muscle Shoals, Dwayne kicks off the album with his slide playing on Marley Pert Drive and also plays on Dirty Old Man, Sweep Around Your Own Back Door, and the song first made famous by his old friends in the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, Mr. Bojangles. Herbie Mann, Push Push, Embryo, 1971. Dwayne finally gets his chance to show that he can more than hold his own in the world of jazz funk. When the album was reissued in 1989, it included an additional track and the credit featuring Dwayne Allman on the back of the CD. Judy Mahan, Moments, Atco, 1970. Mahan's debut album on Atco, including Allman on Everlovin' Ways. The new rock band, Rock Steady, back with Little David. Scott single, 
1968. The new rock band consisted primarily of session players at the same studio where Dwayne and Greg recorded with the 31st of February. Dwayne sat in on both sides of this single. Laura Nero Christmas and the Beads of Sweat Columbia, 1971 Appearing only on Beads of Sweat, Allman once again gets his own separate credit on the back of the album. Wilson Pickett, Hey Jude, Atlantic, 1969. Dwayne's lead guitar work on the title track brought him to the attention of Jerry Wexler and Phil Walden, resulting in Allman's signing with Capricorn Records. Despite his now legendary playing on several of the album's 11 songs, the original credits listed him as David Allman. Otis Rush Morning in the Morning, Cotillion, 1969. Produced by Mike Bloomfield and Nick Gravenitis at Fame Studios, this one has a standout performance by Duane on Reap What You Sow, the song that includes the phrase from which the album's title was derived. Sam Samudio, Sam, Hard and Heavy, Atlantic, 1971. Best known as the leader of Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs, remember Wooly Bully? Samudio was produced by Tom Dowd on this solo album, which includes Allman's Dobro work on the John Lee Hooker song, Going Upstairs. Key to the Highway, back by me and Bobby McGee. Atlantic Single, 1971. Dwayne played Dobro on Me and Bobby McGee, a track that did not appear on the Hard and Heavy album. Boz Gags, Atlantic, 1969. Long before his string of hits for Columbia, Skaggs cut this album at Muscle Shoals Sound Studios. Fenton Robinson's Loan Me a Dime, with its long guitar solo by Dwayne, is a classic. The record also includes Dwayne's Dobro playing on the Jimmy Rogers standard, Waiting for a Train. Soul Survivors Take Another Look Atco, 1969 Blue-Eyed Soul from the Expressway to Your Heart Hitmakers Dwayne takes a fine slide solo on Darkness. Irma Thomas In Between Tears Fungus, 1973. As with Doris Duke's I'm a Loser, this album features Dwayne Allman and Pete Carr back together again in the studio. Willie Walker, A Lucky Loser, backed with Warm to Cool to Cold. Checker Single, 1968. Walker recorded this 45 for Chess Records subsidiary, Checker. The A-side is one of the great lost singles of the era, tastefully filled with Dwayne's trademark licks. Spencer Wiggins I Never Loved a Woman the Way I Love You backed with Soul City USA. Gold Wax Single, 1969 Horn-laden Southern Soul This is Wiggins' gender-reverse take on Aretha's hit with Dwayne Allman's call-and-response guitar work throughout. The Dwayne Allman Compilations An Anthology Capricorn, 1972 Released the year after his death, this 19-track double album captures many of the highlights of Dwayne Allman's life and music. Beginning with the B.B. King medley from the ill-fated Hourglass Sessions of Fame and ending with Dwayne's own Little Martha from Eat a Peach, the first LP includes Wilson Pickett's Hey Jude, the recording that led Dwayne out of the wilderness and into the promised land, Clarence Carter's The Road of Love with its incendiary slide solo, Going Down Slow from Dwayne's aborted solo project, Games People Play, King Curtis's Grammy-winning single, 
and the 13-minute Loan Me a Dime from Boz Skaggs' debut album. The second disc includes the alternate take of Cowboy's Please Be With Me, featuring Dwayne's beautiful dobro work, Mean Old World, a previously unreleased duet by Dwayne and Eric Clapton, five recordings by the ABB, and Derek and the Dominoes' epic, the full-length version of Layla. Dialogues Capricorn, 1972 This promotional-only album was shipped to radio stations to coincide with the release of an anthology. It includes Ed Shane's 1970 interview with Dwayne, as well as Shane's then-current interviews with Jerry Wexler of Atlantic Records and John Landau of Rolling Stone. Also on ALP is the insightful Dwayne Allman Radio Hour, a one-time event hosted by Allman on Atlanta's WPLO-FM in 1970. They gave Dwayne the opportunity to discuss some of his musical influences, including John Coltrane and Miles Davis. An Anthology, Volume 2, Capricorn, 1974. 21 additional great moments from Dwayne's work as a sideman and with the Allman Brothers. This second two-record set includes Happily Married Man and No Money Down, two more songs from Allman's unfinished solo album. Herbie Mann's Push Push, Dwayne's foray into jazz, Delaney and Bonnie's Come On In My Kitchen, a live recording with Dwayne on acoustic slide guitar, and Dimples, the only song featuring Dwayne on lead vocals during his days with the Allman Brothers Band. The Best of Dwayne Allman, Capricorn, 1979. This 10-song collection brings together some of the finest moments from the two anthology albums. The Guitars of Dwayne Allman in bars, rehearsal spaces, dorm rooms, all-night diners, and numerous guitar forums across the Internet, stories about Dwayne Allman's guitars continually abound among musicians and fans, some of which might actually be true. Attempting to discern fact from fiction is no easy task when it comes to tracking down specific instruments played by Allman from around 1960 until his death in late 1971. The following information is based on photographs, the memories of musicians in Dwayne's circle during his lifetime, Allman's guitar is currently on loan to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum, conversations with Walter Carter, historian for the Gibson Guitar Corporation, interviews with Lee Hazen, Kirk West, and Delaney Bramlett, conducted by Dave Kyle, and information from other guitar experts, including Kurt Linhoff, Bob Brosman, Don Butler, Jim Wagner, Brian Mays, Matt Ferguson, Mike Riley, Peter Lenheiser, and Derek Bowers. This is not intended to be an exhaustive inventory of every guitar Dwayne Allman ever played or owned. Furthermore, having listed those who were helpful in assembling this information, I should point out that any possible inaccuracies about the instruments discussed here are entirely my responsibility. Dwayne Allman's first electric guitar was a double cutaway 1959 Gibson Les Paul Jr. It was owned for several years by Delaney Bramlett, later sold to a San Francisco collector, and now belongs to a collector in Japan. Bramlett told Dave Kyle how he came to acquire the instrument. I was somewhere, Atlanta, I think. When we were traveling, doing shows, I would wake up early and go out to pawn shops. I saw this little junior, and I believe I picked it up for 60 bucks. I brought it back to the hotel, no case or anything. Dwayne was sitting there, and he kept looking over at me. Then he would look at the floor, then back at me. Finally, he said, Would you look at the back of that and see if there is a gouge that looks like a thumbnail scratched it? 
I turned it over and said, yeah, boy, there it is. He said, damn it. That's where I hocked that thing. He had gotten drunk and pawned it and forgot where. He said, that's my first electric guitar. Can I have it back? Bramlett laughed and told Allman, no way. Greg Allman told Guitar Player magazine in October 1981 that he got his first electric guitar, a Fender Music Master, in 1960. By this time, Dwayne had to have one, Greg said. Mom got him an electric. It was a Les Paul Jr., one of those old purple ones with the real thin body and just one pickup. It actually would have been cherry red, but the mahogany body of the guitar might have caused it to appear purple, at least to Greg. Walter Carter points out that the guitar has been altered. It would have originally had a wraparound bridge tailpiece rather than the tunomatic and stop bar. Another of Allman's early guitars, a 56 or 57 Fender Stratocaster, originally belonged to Daytona Beach recording enthusiast Lee Hazen. Hazen told Dave Kyle, I had rewired it and put some special features on it. It had a rotary switch with 11 positions, 11 different capacitors in the tone control circuit. I had modified the selector switch to five positions by filing extra notches in the little detent. Then I put two phase switches on it for the second pickup. I put another switch that would connect the first and third pickups so you could get any combination of the three pickups in any combination of phase. You could get all of these weird sounds. Dwayne's friend Sylvan Wells confirms the modifications, saying the Strat had little switches that Lee had put in and nobody knew what they were for. In an early promotional photo of the Almond Joys, Dwayne is seen holding a mid-1960s Gibson ES-335 with block inlays and a Bigsby vibrato tailpiece. According to Peter Leinheiser, the Bigsby was optional on the 335 during that time. Allman owned this guitar when he was in the Escorts. He can be seen playing it in the photos of the April 17, 1965 concert when the Escorts and the Nightcrawlers opened for the Beach Boys. Greg says that while Dwayne was still in the Allman Joys, and also during his hourglass days, he played a Fender Telecaster with a Stratocaster neck. According to Pete Carr, Dwayne came back from a series of Allman Joys gigs in Greenwich Village with a white or yellowish Telecaster with a silver metal Vox Fuzz Distortion box mounted on it. In a May 1973 Guitar Player article, Richard Albero wrote, In those days, Dwayne was playing through a very early model blonde Fender Telecaster with Fender's 150 rock and roll strings. He used Vox Super Beetle amps, a very popular model at the time, with six 10-inch speakers and two horns. He had a distortion device, somewhat like a fuzz tone, that he actually attached on a little bracket connected to the volume and treble knobs. He also had an Echoplex tape delay unit. In the same GP article, Albero wrote, The first Hourglass album was cut with his Fender Telecaster played through box amplifiers, while the second was through a Fender Twin Reverb. When Allman became a studio musician in Muscle Shoals, his guitar of choice was a Stratocaster. Mainly at the time, recalls Jimmy Johnson, Dwayne used a Strat and a Fender Twin Amp with JBLs. He had one gadget, a fuzz face, and that was it. He was going through it all the time, although he might not have always had it kicked in. He used a lot of feedback, between the pickups and the speakers, incredible stuff, sustain for the world. And the thing about his fuzz face was when he'd pop that 9-volt battery in there, a new one wouldn't suit him. He would actually, some way, get batteries that were almost worn out because the fuzz face had a special sound 
just for so many hours with the batteries at a certain strength. He was into weak batteries. Along with the Stratocaster he used in his early session days, Allman had at least two more Strats in his arsenal. The Hard Rock Cafe now owns one of them, while another was in Delaney Bramlett's collection for a number of years. When Dave Kyle asked Bramlett how he came to own Dwayne's three-tone sunburst, Rosewood Fretboard 61 Strat, he said, I begged and begged and begged. He finally got sick of me begging. He knew I loved it. Every time he would join me on the road or whatever, I would make him play my guitar and I would play his Stratocaster. We were somewhere and he had to get back to Macon for some reason. He used to climb up the vines outside my window to my balcony and come into my bedroom and wake me up. I told him I was tired that night and I wanted to go to sleep. I locked the window so he couldn't get in and went to bed. I heard this bam, bam, bam. I just figured he wanted me to get up and go to town or something, so I didn't get up. He was trying to wake me to get a ride to the airport. So he went over and knocked on my brother Johnny's door to get a ride. He wrote a note and left it on the guitar. Wear it in good health. I know you love it, Dwayne. He told my brother, give this to Delaney. I know he loves it so much. I woke up the next morning and Johnny said, Dwayne left you a present. It's all scratched up because he had a leather string around the neck and he would just hang it from a nail on the wall. Dwayne's primary resonator guitar was a 14-fret National Duolian. Bob Brosman, the author of The History and Artistry of National Resonator Instruments, says Duane's Duolium was made between 1937 and 1939. Brosman characterizes the model Almond owned as bottom of the line, preferred by many blues players. Among Almond's other acoustic instruments was a Gibson L00, which Walter Carter describes as Gibson's most popular acoustic of the pre-World War II era. He says Duane's L00 was made in the late 1930s or early 1940s. The first of Allman's Gibson Les Pauls was his 1957 Gold Top, serial number 7-3312. He bought the guitar early in the Allman Brothers Band era and can be seen playing it in photos from the Atlanta International Pop Festival in July 1970. Duane played this guitar throughout the recording of Idle Wild South, and, maybe more significantly, it was used on Layla, according to Don Butler. According to a number of sources, Duane traded his gold top for a 58, or later, Cherry Sunburst at Les Paul on September 16, 1970, after jamming with a band called the Stone Balloon in Daytona Beach. As the story goes, Duane agreed to pay the band's guitar player a few hundred dollars as part of the trade. Duane took the guitarist with him to get the money, but not before, allegedly, he surreptitiously instructed Rhodey's Red Dog and Joe Dan Petty, or Kim Payne, depending on who's telling the story, to switch the pickups on the two guitars. Don Butler says, I'm inclined to believe it's a 58. The top's plainer than that on a 59 or 60. On Wednesday, July 21, 1971, the Allman Brothers Band played two shows at the Schaefer Music Festival in Central Park. The place must have been packed with photographers, as more pictures of Duane seem to have been taken on that day than at any other event in his career. Because of the many photos of Duane in Central Park that have appeared in many publications, one could get the impression that the guitar he was playing that day was his main instrument. In fact, on the ABB albums recorded and released during his lifetime, he was usually playing one of the aforementioned Les Pauls. And therein lies one of the mysteries surrounding the guitar Allman used to play slide at the Schaefer Music Festival. As Gibson guitar buffs are well aware, 
the Les Paul underwent a radical design change in the early 1960s. From 1961 through late 1963, the double cutaway body style known today as the SG was called a Les Paul standard, and Les Paul's name was inscribed on the truss rod cover. After 1963, the Les Paul name was dropped. This happened, says Walter Carter, because Gibson's agreement, temporarily, ended with Les Paul in 1963. After that, the double cutaway guitar became the SG standard, and the truss rod cover was blank. In some of the photos of Allman at Central Park, the blank truss rod cover can clearly be seen. So from reviewing the photographic evidence, it initially appeared that Duane was playing an SG from late 1963 or thereafter. The instrument's pick guard is another clue. The small pick guard was used only through 1965, Walter Carter says. So that would be the latest that this guitar could be. The guitar in question is currently on loan to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum. After my initial conversation with Walter Carter, Jim Henke, chief curator of the museum, informed me that its serial number is 15263. Upon receiving this information, Carter checked the Gibson files and discovered that the guitar was entered into the ledger books on April 26, 1961. Therefore, the instrument Duane used to play slide at the Schaefer Music Festival was not a 1963 SG standard, as has been reported. It was a 1961 Les Paul standard. But what about that blank truss rod cover? If the factory ran out of the Les Paul covers, says Carter, they would have used plain ones rather than hold up production. The most obvious modification to the guitar is its missing tailpiece. A vibrato was standard equipment on this model, according to Carter. There were two types of vibratos and tailpieces during that era, he says. A complicated side-to-side -side mechanism that didn't work well at all, and a standard up-and-down action vibrato that was basically a U-shaped spring. Both vibratos had the long cover plate with engraved lyre. Jim Henke states that there were still four screw holes on the body of the guitar where the tailpiece was once attached. Because the SG continues to be manufactured by Gibson to the present day, and due to the fact that the name Les Paul Standard applied to the model for such a brief time, all of the Gibson guitars of this design, even those from 1961 through 1963, are usually referred to as SGs. Don Butler states that the SG slant Les Paul in question had been purchased by Dickie Betts in 1970. He had a fairly new Gibson ES-345 before that, which had the trapeze tailpiece instead of the stop tailpiece, explains Butler. He liked the SG better, but really wanted a Les Paul gold top. Dwayne bought the SG from Dickey so Dickey could buy a gold top. Dwayne tuned the SG to open E and used it for slide. After Dwayne's death, the guitar ended up with Jerry Groom. He was sort of Dwayne's protege, says Butler. There was a guy by the name of Jerry Groom, Kirk West told Dave Kyle, who was a kind of precocious little guitar player from Miami. Dwayne took a shine to him in 1969 or 70. Jerry was, how would you put it, fond of himself. Nobody else was very fond of him except Dwayne, but he was around a lot. Apparently, somewhere along the line, Dwayne had said to Jerry, if anything ever happens to me, I want you to have this guitar. So he got the guitar early in 72. Later, when Groom needed money for an operation, he sold the guitar to Graham Nash's wife, who wanted to give it to her husband as a Christmas present, according to Kirk West. 
It was sold with the condition that it could not be sold again unless it went back to Jerry Groom, his family, or somebody in the Allman Brothers organization. Jerry died in a scuba diving accident before he could buy it back, says Butler. Among the more rarely seen Allman guitars is the Dotneck Gibson ES-335 he used at the Cosmic Carnival in Atlanta on June 13, 1970. It dates to anywhere from 1958 to mid-1962 when the block inlay came in, says Walter Carter. Nothing else changed during that period except the pick guard. And of course, the pick guard is missing. The tuners should be cluesons with plastic tulip-shaped buttons, like the 59 Les Pauls, adds Carter. It looks like metal tuner buttons on Duane's. On close inspection, it can be seen that the body of the 335 is discolored below the stop bar, so it appears to have previously had a Bigsby tailpiece. Finally, and perhaps best known to guitar aficionados, there is Allman's Tobacco Sunburst Les Paul. Nicknamed Hotlanta, although not the guitar he used to record the song of that name, this beautiful instrument was acquired by Duane in June 1971 from vintage guitar dealer Kurt Linhoff. We met through Billy Gibbons, says Linhoff, who introduced me as the best guitar finder in Texas. Duane was in search of a tobacco sunburst Les Paul, and Linhoff agreed to locate one for him. Among the many stories that have circulated about this guitar is that it once belonged to Christopher Cross of Ride Like the Wind fame. Although there is a connection of sorts, here's the real story straight from the man who found the guitar and later delivered it to Dwayne Allman. This high school buddy of Chris Cross's found the guitar. He had paid a guy 80 bucks for it with the peg head broken off and then paid 80 bucks to have the head fixed. He called me up and said, Do you want a sunburst less Paul? I said, well, yeah, bring it over. He brought it over, and it was what Duane had asked for. I said, sure, I'll take it. What do you want? He said, well, I need another guitar. The only thing I had that I was willing to part with was a stripped 54 Stratocaster. I paid him the $160 he had in it cash, plus the Stratocaster that I probably had $100 in, I delivered the guitar on the afternoon of the first of the last Fillmore shows, June 25, 1971, along with a load of tweed Fender Bassman amps and a 60 Fender Jazz Bass for Barry. I swapped the pickups on the guitar and put the strong one in the bridge position. Linhaw says the guitar's name came later. The song, Hot Lana, was in the can already, so the guitar was probably named by Twiggs, Lyndon, while he owned it, or if not, by some dilettante on the Les Paul forum on the Internet who thought it needed a name. It was certainly not named by Duane or Greg. I referred to it as the Tiger for the awesome Tiger Flame Maple used for the top, and Duane used that in conversation at the time but he wasn't the kind of guy to name a guitar. The guitar's model year remains something of a mystery. Derek Bowers at Gibson Guitar Corporation says, there is no serial number on the guitar, and without a serial number, there is no way to say for sure what year the guitar was made. Linhoff, who says he can determine the year of any Les Paul by feeling its neck, believes that it was probably made in late 1959, but adds that since I never touched the neck, it could have been anything. Regarding the tobacco sunburst description, Walter Carter points out that all of the finished color names that we use today, dark burst, faded cherry sunburst, heritage cherry sunburst, and so on, are modern delineations. In 1958, 59, and 60, they were all cherry sunburst. The cherry part usually fades on the originals. 
One other unique feature of the guitar is its back. Kurt West told Dave Kyle that at some point after Dwayne's death, Twiggs Linden had the guitar refretted. Twiggs inlaid Dwayne's name with the old frets, said West. He didn't want to discard anything from Almond's guitar, so he took the old frets and spelled Dwayne's name on the back. Sadly, Twiggs was killed in a skydiving accident in November 1979, ironically, in the town of Dwaynesburg, New York. In the months prior to his death, he had been the tour manager for the Dixie Dregs. With the permission of Lyndon's brothers, Dregs guitarist Steve Morris later used the guitar on a number of the band's records. In a 1982 interview, with Jazz Obrecht of Guitar Player, Morse talked about playing the Les Paul on the recording of Riding High. Since it wasn't my guitar, I couldn't jack up the action, which was so low the slide would touch the frets. So I stuck a toothpick under the first fret. This raised the action just a little bit, and it also meant I couldn't tune up without holding the slide on the twelfth fret. Unless you're playing an open string, which I didn't do at all, you never hear the toothpick, since the fulcrum is between the slide and the bridge. Every string was totally dead, except the one I was playing. I damped everything behind the slide, which was on my third finger, and I damped the strings I wasn't playing with the heel of my hand and my left hand pinky. The key thing was plucking with my fingers rather than using a pick. I always believed that's the way Dwayne Allman got that sound and had that control. When Gibson Guitar Corporation acquired the rights to create its Dwayne Allman Signature Edition Les Paul, this was the guitar they based it on. The instrument was eventually given to Dwayne's daughter, Galadriel and is currently on loan to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum. Dwayne Allman played through a number of different amplifiers during his career, beginning with the aforementioned Vox models and Fender Twins. With the Allman brothers, says Don Butler, Dwayne's Marshall rig was two 50-watt Marshall bass heads with two Marshall bass 100 cabs. The cabs were loaded with a combination of Celestion's and Serwin Vega ER-123 speakers. The ER-123s were Serwin Vega's answer to JBL's D-120s. Dwayne used three Y cables. The first one was right from his cord, which split the signal to the other two, each of which went to an amp head. Dwayne used both channels of his Marshall heads at the same time. Using both channels, he could get both halves of the first tube, which drove the rest of the amp. By using both halves, he got more gain, which gave him more distortion. Dwayne wanted all the gain he could get going right into the amp, and he got it by using the Y cables. For the recording of Layla and other assorted love songs, Allman went in the opposite direction. As Tom Dowd told interviewer Bill Ector, Dwayne and Eric were playing on Fender Champs, and the biggest thing that they had was a Princeton. Of course, Dwayne was used to playing loud, so that was certainly a step down. On the album, Clapton and Allman both proved that sometimes size really doesn't matter. With close miking of the small but cranked up amps in the confines of Criteria Studio, both guitarists were able to recreate the sound of their stage amps. 